Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but throughout the world, and maybe in space, for all we know. But also, <laughs> most importantly, to welcome the four talented, exciting, exuberant, dynamic players of the game of Join Me this week. We are lucky to have back with us Paul Merton, Stephen Fry, Linda Smith, and Clement Freud, and will you please welcome all four of them? And, as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who is going to keep the score, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Radio Theatre in the centre of Broadcasting House, in the centre of this uh, great city of London. And, Stephen, it's your turn to begin. Cats, that is the subject. Tell us something about those lovely creatures in 60 seconds, starting now. McCavity, the mystery cat, was created by T.S. Eliot in his book Old Possums, uh, etc. Uh, Linda Challenge. Sorry, uh. I think there was yes, a hesitation, Linda. Yes. Oh. Linda, you have the subject. A correct challenge, a point to you. The subject is cats. There are 55 seconds starting now. Cats. My neighbours have four cats, and they seem to think that my pond is their own personal uh, Stephen dog. challenged. Uh, two mice. My Mice. neighbours and my oh, pond. God. Yes, well, that's a it's tough a one, but it's correct. Yes. You out, isn't it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Piss <laughs> off. <laughs> You're sharp. Big hiss them. now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stephen, there are 50 seconds available. Cats is back with you starting now. A musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber based on Eliot's poem. Uh, Paul Merton Chan. I've heard it. It's not a musical. <laughs> 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 It is billed as a musical, is so... It really? Yes. <laughs> but the audience appreciated your remarks so much, I give you a bonus point for that interjection. But uh, Stephen was interrupted, so he keeps the subject, and he has 47 seconds available, cats, starting now. There's a dignified self-possession about the members of the feline species. They don't seem to need you. They rub around your ankles, beg for food, and occasionally allow themselves to be nuzzled and petted. But somehow one always feels that they have a private, personal secret which makes them superior to you. Worshipped by ancient Egyptians, cats... <laughs> Paul Challenge. The ancients. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Stephen was trying to say Egyptians, but... I think he was it. trying to say Egyptians, but something else came out, so we <laughs> say that is deviation from language as we understand it, and, um, and there are 29 seconds available starting now. I suppose you can divide people up between cat lovers and cat haters, or people who don't particularly... Uh, Clement Challenge. Two people. Yes, but too many people. So, Clement, you have a correct challenge, and you have 23 seconds. Tell us something about cats, starting now. I once played a game called Trivial Pursuits, in which there was a question... Uh, Stephen Fry challenge. I'm sure he played a game called Trivial Pursuit, not Trivial Pursuits. No, this oh. game was called Trivial Pursuits. Oh, was it? Hmm, okay. This one was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult one, isn't it? Because the actual game that we all know is Trivial Pursuit. Oh, I didn't play that. No. <laughs> is a much better game. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Another impossible task, isn't it? Uh, shall I put it to the audience? No. no, 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 no. no, no. I, I must give you the benefit of the doubt because the, the game, as we all know it, is Trivial Pursuit. So you were correct, Stephen. 20 seconds on Cats, starting now. <laughs> and you've been challenged by Clement Freud again. Hesitation. Hesitation. Yeah, Hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen was waiting for the booing to subside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being yeah, but you see, it all works out fairly. Stephen got a point for that one, and then Clement's got back in again. He's got a point for a correct challenge. He's got cats. He's got 19 seconds starting now. What is it that has two legs and sleeps with cats? And the answer was not Mrs. Cats, but his secretary. <laughs> uh, Paul Challenge. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, what, what's he talking about? <laughs> I don't know what he was, but some of the audience seem to know. 
They obviously had very strange lives, some of those people in our audience yeah. over there, right. But, uh, but the hesitation... The hesitation, is, definitely. Yeah, definitely, yeah. after that, yeah. I'm sure you had to hesitate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ten seconds are available for you, Paul, on cats, starting now. When I look at the average cat, and I suppose I've met quite a few of them over the years, I don't, unlike Steve, and think that they have this great self-possession or they possess a secret. Uh, Steve and John... No, dribble. I'm sorry. My thumb just twitched hopelessly. <laughs> So if it twitched and it's an incorrect challenge, yeah, and it's, uh, it is. and you did, uh, I'm pathetically the whistle, trying to win back the love of the audience. Actually, really? that's all it is. By, by making take more Paul than twitchy win. thumb to do that. <laughs> So as you buzz, as the whistle went, we call that all square, and we applaud now because the uh, whistle went. <laughs> and Paul Merton was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point for doing so, and he's now in the lead, one ahead of Clement Foyd and Stephen Fry, equal in second place. And Linda, it's your turn to begin. Waterloo. Tell us something about that emotive subject in this game, starting now. Waterloo, what a famous battle it began when ABBA, the Swedish songsters, <laughs> entered the charts in April 1974 with that very number, Waterloo. They then marched inexorably forward for the next week when they arrived at number two, laying siege to Jimmy Jacks's seasons in the sun. Uh, uh, Paul Merton, it was Terry, Terry Jacks. Jacks. Yes, yes yeah. <laughs> Yes, so well spotted, uh, Paul. 37 seconds. You tell us something about Waterloo starting now. Terry Jacks, of course, had a one hit with Seasons in the Sun, and as Linda says, it kept Waterloo off the number one spot. Now, that can't be right, because it came about two years <coughs> earlier. Seaman challenge. <laughs> um, well, also a repetition of number. Uh, yes, number he did one, repeat number, number and he went off there. 29 seconds. You tell us something about Waterloo, Stephen, starting now. I may be right in thinking that in 1815, there was a battle called Waterloo <laughs> between... Napoleon, who had uh, just had a quite good victory at Ligny, beating the Prussian troops under Marshal Blucher, and then the next day they engaged Wellington's allied troops. Uh, Clement oh, Foyt. I'm sorry. I, mm, you that? said Napoleon before Wellington. You're quite mistake. Mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a sort of Freudian slip, I mean, that, um, <laughs> then what happens is that no one's ever said that before, have they, Clement? <laughs> Stephen was interrupted, so he gets a point for being interrupted, and he keeps the subject, and there are 13 seconds. Waterloo starting now. There are nicer <laughs> mainline stations in London. I prefer Paddington myself, but Waterloo has a charm of its own. I admire the clock. Some of the platforms are elegant in their own way. The roof has a ceiling with glass and steel girders. Trains run regularly. <laughs> Stephen Fry with points in that round, including one for speaking. So Wendt has moved forward. He's now in the lead, just one ahead of Paul Merton and two ahead of Clement Freud and three ahead of Linda Smith. And Paul Merton, your turn to begin. The subject, guinea pigs. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Guinea pigs are inaccurately named because they don't particularly resemble pigs or cost a guinea. I am told they make wonderful pets for children, not particularly... No. Uh, per Clement point challenged. Hesitation. Hesitation, right, Clement? A point to you and the subject. 48 seconds, guinea pigs starting now. Guinea pigs are a great Peruvian <coughs> delicacy. If you go to a cathedral in the north of that country, you will see a picture of the Last Supper in which they were eating guinea pig. I was deeply impressed. <coughs> Paul challenged. I think you were deeply sedated. <laughs> There's no pictures of guinea pigs. People eating guinea pigs, in, yes. it, it, really, in Peru? Yes. Well, there's only one way to find out. Who's been there? <laughs> there was, Anybody in the audience been to Peru? Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah, pictures of, of, of eating guinea pigs at the Last Supper. Um, yeah, it's true. It is true. Well, I'm glad you came. Thank you very much. How, how much... Freud was in the audience I know, today. Yes. <laughs> and how much did Clement Freud give you for that? <laughs> Right, so we'll uh, go with that lady in the audience <laughs> and say... I'm sorry. You, well, <laughs> uh, is the lady in the audience going to become a regular feature that we <laughs> appeal to? We, we could use it, couldn't we? It's, yeah. a, it's a good gimmick. It okay. could go if uh, we get a situation like that and Clement Roy comes on as often as he does and raises these particular points. So thank you very much, anyway. We're, we're deeply grateful. And um, <laughs> he has 36 seconds to continue on guinea pigs starting now. There's no reason in the world why one shouldn't eat guinea pigs. Ping. Uh, uh, salmon fried challenge. A repetition of eat. You did have eat before. Uh, yes. So <laughs> eating. 
Oh, did you? Eating. They were eating before. Was it? Yes, yeah. he was eating. So you were agreeing with me until Clement told you. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. I just, uh, yeah. All this is academic until we find out what the lady in the audience said. <laughs> <laughs> no. She is our final arbiter. Uh, did exactly. you say eating or eating? <laughs> You did actually say eating, you're quite right, uh, Clement. So, 32 seconds, you keep the subject. Guinea pigs starting now. You keep them in a cage and give them to children so that they can ask their friends in to come and feed them lettuce, tomato, <laughs> cross and black <laughs> and salad. Clement, Paul, you challenge. He ran out of list. He ran out of list. <laughs> It is difficult to list, and so what? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hesitation, 23 seconds, guinea pigs with you, Paul, starting now. They're enormous fun if you inflate them with helium gas, because they fall <laughs> across the London sky, and little children have been known in the east end of London to throw rocks at them as they pass gaily over their rooftops. <laughs> it's an old English custom. I know people are listening to this programme all over the world. The lady in the audience will back me up. She's been to Peru. It's <laughs> a wonderful thing that happens with guinea pigs. Treated very much as the national pet over here. There is a recreation council devoted to all kinds of aspects of the <laughs> Keep going to the whistle again. The next point. You're equal now in the lead with Stephen Fry, just one ahead of Clement Freud. And Clement, your turn to begin. The subject, fungi. Would you tell us something about those in this game starting now? Fun is what guinea pigs have, which is why there are so many of them. And guy is another name for a chap. Fungi is also a general ah. mushroom. Uh, uh, Stephen Challenge. I, I felt that was it's a bit on... early for yes. Was it? Yeah. Was it? I'm sorry. It yeah. was a hesitation, definitely. Oh, well, Clements yes. decided it wasn't. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> no. Lady in the audience. What about <laughs> A definite hesitation. 49 seconds for you, Stephen, on fungi starting now. Antonio Carluccio of the Neil's Yard restaurant seems to have made quite a representation. Uh, uh, Paul, you challenged sort of hesitation, yeah. yeah. It was. All right, Paul. 45 seconds, fungi starting now. There is a form of mushroom that's called magic, and if you have this particular type of edible fungi, you can go through all kinds of wonderful things. You can imagine... Uh, you... Steve, a Clement challenge. Kinds. Yes, unfortunately for What's you. There? Yeah. Kinds, right? Mm. 36 seconds are available. Back with you, Clement Fungi, starting now. The French are the great experts, and Antonio Carluccio, who is actually Italian, is an exponent of the art of dedicating and identifying fungi. Shiitake, morel, <laughs> sip, chanterelle. There are so many, and in the Far East... Where there's a... Uh, Stephen, you challenge. I was leaping onto a hesitation that barely existed. Well, it was, a, it was a teetering on it, so we give you the benefit oh, of the doubt on this occasion because it went against you last time, Stephen, so oh, you it's have... it's like that, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I give you the benefit of the doubt. Fun guys, back with you. 17 seconds starting now. The Tartuffi Bianchi, the white truffles of the Piedmont area, Alba in particular, are simply magnificent. Their fragrance will fill a room even the size of this auditorium here, usually round about autumn, the hounds that sniff out, unlike the pigs that do it in France and Perigord for the black. <laughs> so Stephen Fry, he's moved forward. He's now gone into the lead ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud. They're following just behind. Stephen! Oh, here's a good subject, especially today with the audience we have in front of us, because the, the subject is the audience. Oh, my Lord. So, will you tell us something about the audience in 60 seconds, starting now? Handsome, exquisitely formed, beautifully thighed, wondrously coiffured, marvellously dressed. Um, Paul Merton, Has he seen the sixth row? <laughs> <laughs> Any other challenge within the rules of just a minute? No. <laughs> <laughs> you missed them marvellously. Creep. <laughs> you should be able to. And uh, 55 seconds, still with you, Stephen, on the audience starting now. The audience I had with the Pope some years ago was something of a disappointment. He did not appreciate my embracing him quite as vigorously as I did, <laughs> uh, nor did he agree with me uh, on my deeper theological views that he was a son of an ass for being so backward and right-wing and everything. But I'm not going to be more political here. It was not a successful audience. I can go that far. Our audience here today, however, is magnificently, wondrously perfect, and I very much admire them for their patience and their understanding and the way they have sat through in this hot weather and listened to us rambling on for a minute or a few seconds at least on subjects chosen on the card. The audience sits there quietly, occasionally laughs, occasionally, oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> and, uh, Paul, you got in first. Yes. yes. 
He deserves a round of applause. What often happens, somebody goes for a long time on a subject. He gets no points for it. Someone comes in towards the end and gets the benefit of uh, 16 seconds available with a correct challenge from you, Paul, the audience starting now. I can honestly say, of all the audiences we've had this evening, this is by far the best. <laughs> there was a lot that came in about half past seven that were rubbish. Oh, they were terrible. We were back there sweating buckets, saying we're not going out in front of that lot. But thankfully, this lot are very, very good. It's two uh, lots. Stephen Challenge. Rip of lot. There were too many lots there, yeah. yes. So, Stephen, you've got in with two seconds to go on the audience starting now. The audience is patient, kind, <laughs> tolerant. So, Stephen Fry, speaking as the whistle went, once again gained that extra point, and others in the round, he's now taking a strong lead ahead of Paul Merton, followed by Clement Freud and Linda Smith. And, Paul, your turn to begin. The subject, fans. Tell us something about fans in just a minute, starting now. They would be very useful objects here tonight on the hottest day of the year. The audience have been sitting here very calmly, very patiently. That's two, very. that's three. Uh, yes. <laughs> And you spotted it yourself, but Stephen pressed first, so 53 seconds on fans with you, Stephen, starting now. I once heard someone describe a play of Oscar Wilde's as Lady Fandemir's Wind. It is, of course, <laughs> not quite the right uh, description of its title. Fans are very useful in hot weather because um, when they admire your work... Uh, Linda Challenge. I thought there was an urn, but I could be wrong. I probably am. You are right. I'm right. Yes, well done. You are. Be patronised. You have 43 seconds. <laughs> 43 seconds, fans with you, Linda, starting now. Fans were very popular in Victorian times when ladies would fan themselves because they'd be too hot, sitting very close to the fire. Of course, in those days, they hadn't invented the practice of moving further away from the fire. They were very backward. Uh, A couple of fires, I think. There were were two fires, yes. Mm -hmm. And 29 seconds are available on fans with you, Stephen, starting now. Made of ivory and chicken skin, particularly in Paris, where they were in great vogue in the 18th and early 19th centuries. However, electric fans, which move round when you pull up the little knob and then stay still when you push it down again, are very popular too over here. Uh, Clement Challenge. The repetition of very. Very, yes, indeed, oh, right. Clement, 14 seconds. Tell us something about fans starting now. Plymouth Argyle has some Arden fans who wear <laughs> green and white and black scarves. And when the team gets a corner, they do a lap of honour because very rarely does that football association. Clement <laughs> <laughs> Floyd speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point for doing so. He's moved forward. He's now in third place, just ahead of Linda, one point behind Paul Merton, and um, four behind uh, Stephen Fry, who's still our leader. Linda, it is your turn to begin, and the subject is Feng Shui. Tell us something about Feng Shui in just a minute, starting now. Feng Shui, which should be correctly pronounced a number 39, is the ancient oriental art of getting money off of simpletons. It involves... It it involves someone coming to your house and saying, Oh, the sofa in front of the front door, that's really bad karma. If I want furniture moved, I get picked. Not some dopey hippie called Crispin in a caftan who hasn't washed since he last went to Glastonbury, which he's never come back from since he first went there in 1967. I don't understand what is wrong with people. The phrase more money than sense comes to mind, doesn't it? You sometimes. Oh, must have. Ah. <laughs> Well, the audience certainly enjoyed it. And you went for, my goodness me, four, th- 39 seconds. I went for 39 Le- seconds. No, 49, se- 49 seconds. 49, 49 seconds. Only 11 seconds available. I think she, because she, she, you applauded and she kept going through the applause, I think she should have a bonus point for what she contributed, don't you? <laughs> yes. Yes. After all, she's only a lady. Yes. <laughs> Feng Shui, with you, Clement, starting now. There's no aspect of life to which you can't... (laughs) (laughs) It's probably true, but it's... It's probably true, (laughs) yes. A little bit too gnomic. Right. Seven seconds for you to tell us something about this subject, uh, Stephen, starting now. Feng Shui, as Linda told us it should be pronounced, certainly does seem to be sweeping the nation, and I would heartily endorse her view that it is a load of old arse. (laughs) 
Right, so Stephen was speaking as a whistle when gained the extra point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And it's also your turn to begin, Stephen. And the subject is going to the gym. <laughs> I don't know whether this is one of your habitual pastimes, but uh, talk on it. 60 seconds if you can, starting now. One look at my homed body, which resembles nothing so much more than a bin liner full of yoghurt, will tell you that the, <laughs> the gym and I are strangers. I have been to a gymnasium more than once. Interestingly, by the way, the word comes from the Greek gumnos, meaning naked. People are not entirely naked. They're nude, fog up. And <laughs> Clement I'm afraid too naked. There's too, too naked. much nakedness, nakedness yes. It. it doesn't come over so well on radio, but uh, you can't repeat <laughs> the words, which he did. 44 seconds available. Clement, going to the gym starting now. Going to the gym is uplifting, and coming back from the gym is quite a lot of fun. Being at the gym is so hugely boring. <laughs> All those awful machines called Pilati, or perhaps Pirati, which... Uh, Stephen, challenge. Uh, is there a machine called Pilati? I thought it was a type of exercise, isn't it? Pilati? There is a machine as well. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, good, thank you. Well, no, I think Clement deserves a point for, no, for, no, for no, no, sharing no, that information. We learn a lot of things yeah. in this yeah. uh, show, yeah. that's Stephen, yes. But your interruption <laughs> means Clement has another point, but he can keep the subject and can continue for 26 seconds, going to the gym, Clement, starting now. An excellent way to go to the gym is to start at Marble Arch, pursue Oxford Street, make towards Piccadilly Circus, and then hove to the left, which would be east, in the direction of Covent Garden, where after there is an establishment called the Pineapple Club, a sort of gymnasium for the upper market, well-heeled women and men who live in that part of... <laughs> Troy gained points in that round, including one for speaking as a whistle. Went. He's moved forward into second place now, just only three to, points. To a master at work, wasn't it? I yes, felt, yes, yes. Know? Well, he's had some practice, 34 yeah. years, but uh, it's paid off, and he really is absolutely excellent. <laughs> and Paul, your turn to begin. And the subject is down the plug hole. Tell us something about Down the Plug Hole in just a minute, starting now. Down the Plug Hole is a horrible world of hairiness. Peruvian guinea pigs breed down there. Ask the lady in the audience, she's lived through it. They get in the dark and they wall together and suddenly before you know you, there's more hamsters. No, I didn't say hamsters before, I just said hamsters twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stephen, oh, you chat. By avoiding saying hamsters twice, he, yes, he managed to say it twice. Right, he did it twice. So you've got in first, uh, Stephen, 47 seconds down the Plug Hole, starting now. I have a dim memory of a musical song saying my bibby's gone down the plug hole. I don't remember much more of it, but clearly... Uh, Paul Merton my Jones. baby's gone down the drain, my babies have gone down the plug hole, I'll never see baby again. That's yeah. the end yeah, of it. That's the end of it. No, it's not the end. That's it, is, it, is, it, is it not? Does it go not, on? Yeah, Clement, then the on. angels say, mm -hmm. yeah. your baby is perfectly happy. Not gone. He won't need a bath anymore. Your baby has gone down the plug hole, not lost, just gone, gone before. Oh. <laughs> Wasn't that a touching moment of memorabilia? I mean, you, I guess you couldn't... There's not a dry eye in the audience after that. I was sweating. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but where are we in just a minute? Uh, because uh, you challenged... I, I, I challenged, but I turned out to be a wrong challenge. As, well, thank you very much. Right, 42 seconds. Stephen, still with you, down the plug hole, starting now. This show was in danger of going down the plug hole earlier until it was rescued by some skill, wit and judgement on the part of our beloved chairman and uh, the three other panellists. Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Deviation. Why? Nobody. <laughs> but nobody would call you a beloved chairman. <laughs> Stephen just Can we have has. a vote on it? <laughs> Steve, all right, ask the audience to vote on it. If you agree with Stephen, cheer. If you disagree, just, boo. Oh, right, yes. Nicholas, you have gone down this mob rule <laughs> route before and it <laughs> didn't work out that well for you. Don't, just, I, I think we should let sleeping audiences lie and they're definitely <laughs> I'm, I'm not embarrassed. Yeah. Well, there we are. But cheer I think... for how much you love Nicholas. No, please, come back. <laughs> I think we'll leave it at that and <laughs> say, uh, um, uh, but Clement Freud, that was an incorrect challenge. I'd have given against you whatever you said after that. Uh, <laughs> Stephen has another point. He has down the plug hole starting now. Clement's challenge, of course, went down the plug hole just now. And I think. Uh, Clement challenge again. Of course. Oh, really? Yes, hmm. unfortunately, well, yes. yes. So, I, in spite of what Clement said, you see, yeah. I'm always very fair. Yeah. Clement, you have a correct challenge. You have 31 seconds down the plug hole starting now. There was a song which began, A mother was bathing a baby one night, The youngest of eight and a terrible mite. 
She only turned round to get soap from the rack. She wasn't a minute. But when she turned back, the thing had gone in anguish, she cried. Oh, where is my... The angels replied, <laughs> my baby has gone down. <laughs> I've been challenged. You were challenged. Because it's instead the of a piece of... Theatrical music, you uh, avoid I, the musical. I know. It's, <laughs> it's the old-time musical, again. just a minute <laughs> version of the old... Oh, uh, yes, because you, you didn't want to repeat the word baby, so you paused instead and Stephen <laughs> came in with a challenge. So, Stephen, the eight seconds on down the plug hole starting now. And it, what a wonderful song it is. I think I'm going to go home and learn it because I'd love to be able to perform it professionally. My baby's gone down the plug hole. What a lovely thought. <laughs> so Stephen Fry got more points in that round, has increased his lead and went into the final round. And actually, Stephen, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is email. So um, will you tell us something about email in this game starting now? The email of the species is more deadly than the male, you might argue. <laughs> it swept the world, has it not? The net, internet, call it what you will. It has made an enormous impression on the lives of the entire planet populations. It seems that now correspondence can become faster, quicker, easier, cheaper and more thorough. You can contain applications, pictures, music, sound within email such that now you can upload and download files... <laughs> Uh, Linda challenged. A uh, bit mean, but was that hesitation? No, it wasn't hesitation. What about the oh, load? Oh, and now as well, and load. Upload and download are both um, separate words. Right. <laughs> 31 seconds. Continue on email, Stephen, starting now. All you have to do is send a piece of email to another person and use their address, their email formulation, which has that curious at symbol, an A with a half a circle or three quarters perhaps around it, and they're instantly at their box, their Inbox, which is sort of... Uh, Clement Challenge. Three there. Yes, three yes, there. Yes, yes, really, yes. Right, so we're there, yeah. there, there. Right, 14 seconds. You have got email, Clement, starting now. I know nothing about email other than dots and comms and obliques and slashes come in orders which I do not comprehend nor have any desire to whatever. <laughs> email people... <laughs> Well, as I said, uh, that was to be the last round, and indeed it was. And just to give you the final situation, well, they all contributed so much. But when it comes to the points, let me tell you that Linda didn't get quite as many as Paul Merton, and he didn't get quite as many as Clement Freud, and none of them got quite as many as Stephen Fry. So, Stephen, out in the lead, we say, you are the winner this week. <laughs> and... It only remains for me to say thank you to our four delightful and uh, talented players of the game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Linda Smith and uh, Stephen Fry. And also I thank uh, Janet uh, Staplehurst for keeping the score for me and blowing her whistle, and Claire Jones, who is our producer director on this show, and we're grateful to Ian Messiter, the original creator of Just a Minute. And we're very grateful to this audience who have sat in this hot studio on a hot summer's day in the radio theatre here for coming along and cheering us on our way. From our audience, from the panel, from everyone else, and me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and also to welcome the four exciting individual and... Uh, aggressive players of the game <laughs> who have joined me this week. We welcome back the irrepressible Tony Hawks, the irreplaceable Clement Freud, the irredeemable Jeremy Hardy, and the irresistible Sue Perkins. Would you please welcome all four of them? 
And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Dorking Halls in Dorking. <laughs> And we have a truly hyped-up dorking audience in front of us. <laughs> in other words, we're in the county of Surrey, and we're delighted to be here as we start the show this week with Clement Freud and Clement the subject of positive thinking. Can you talk on that subject in this game starting now? Confucius was a great one for positive thinking. He wrote, it is a mark of insincerity of purpose to seek an emperor in a low-down tea shop. And I would like to add to that that the Liberal Democrats will win the next government. <laughs> Just a minute will run forever. The British Broadcasting Corporation... Um, Tony Hawkes is challenged. What do you have to enter to win a government? <laughs> An election. I All right. think it's being a little bit sort of nitpicking on that one. Uh, I withdraw I that remark. I think we knew what Clement meant, and I will give Clement the benefit of the doubt on the occasion, and I might and find a chance to, um, to return it to you. Right? So, Clement, we call that an incorrect challenge, so you get a I'm point so for that. I'm so you... embarrassed. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. Others will be later on. Uh, <laughs> And you have 39 seconds. You take keep the subject, positive thinking starting now. Positive thinking is, of course, the opposite of negative thinking. Thoughts such as conservatives might easily get a majority next time the country... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sue Perkins' challenge. Yes, Sue. Hesitation. Yes, there was hesitation, Sue. So you now have a point for a correct challenge, and you take over the subject, which is positive thinking, and there are 27 seconds available starting now. When my optician informed me that I was short-sighted, I became very depressed, and he advised me I might want to take up a course, what he described as positive thinking. This involved me removing my spectacles, standing in front of a mirror, and saying, I love myself. Unfortunately, because I'd removed my glasses, I couldn't actually see... <laughs> my own face. Therefore, it was actually easier than normal to find myself endearing. <laughs> but things I like... Uh, uh, <laughs> Tony, you did actually challenge before the whistle went. I can't go through with it. <laughs> <laughs> there are rules. You can, uh, you can withdraw or you can... Uh... I'm withdrawing, I tell you. <laughs> Because I'm sure you were going to have her for hesitation, and she did hesitate. Yeah, but, but I you didn't realise you... it was so near the end of the thing, you see. Well, as Sue has only played the game mm. once before, I think we'll give her the benefit of the doubt and say that he's going to withdraw his challenge. So you were technically speaking as the whistle went, Sue, in which case you gained that extra point for doing so, and at the end of that round, you've taken the lead. <laughs> and you begin the next round, so, Sue, and the subject is bath time. Oh, what a lovely subject. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. In a very famous bath time incident, the Greek thinker Archimedes leapt from the soapy suds crying, Ulrika! <laughs> Not many know that the Swedish blonde-haired meteorologist was such an inspiration and muse to the thinkers of the early age. But indeed, the play Medea was written about Anne Diamond, an embittered woman, and the host of GMTV presenters, Eamon Holmes, Fiona Phillips, formed the core of the Furies in Oresteia. <laughs> in my own bathtub, I like to talk to Barry Norman, <laughs> formerly of the BBC, but now languishing with Sky for a great deal more money than I will ever earn. I talk to him about my feature-length film, which is a post-feminist reworking of the Bible, featuring Kevin Costner as Lot, turned into a pillar of salt, but still managing to pump out ten films a year for a total of $40 million. Other things I contemplate in my bathtub... So, Sue Perkins started with the subject and finished with the subject, went for the full 60 seconds, and that hasn't happened for a very long time. And for someone who's only just started playing the game, that was very, very applaudable. And the audience showed their appreciation with the way they clapped. And you have increased your lead, because you not only get a point for speaking when the whistle went, but you get a bonus point for going without being interruption for 60 seconds. 
Jeremy Hardy, would you take the next subject? It is bringing home the bacon. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. If you bring home the bacon, it means you are the breadwinner. Now, by that, I don't intend to say that you have won some of that said yeast-based food <laughs> in the sense of an envelope appearing through your door saying, congratulations, you may be the proud winner of a sliced whole meal. <laughs> what I am saying is you have brought home the income upon which your family will live. You may not be the sole person doing this, but in a sense you have brought home that bacon. The Roman army were paid not in money or salt, but in fact bacon. This is something that very few people realise, because in those days they didn't have currency, because you simply can't fry money in the way that you can with rashers. Another thing you can do with bacon is skin grafts. You thought <laughs> pigs could only be used for their organs. So, Jeremy Hardy, starting with the subject, completely went for the full 60 seconds without being interrupted and without hesitating, repeating himself or deviating. So he gets a point for speaking as a whistle went and the bonus point for not being interrupted. That has never happened in just a minute before. Two consecutive rounds for the full 60 seconds. We are making history today. <laughs> and you good people of Dorking can now go home and say, I was there! <laughs> was there when it happened. Am I next, Nicholas? Yes, you're next. No pressure, then. Right, uh... <laughs> <laughs> your turn to begin. Tony, jumping to conclusions. Try to see if you can go on that one for 60 seconds, starting now. I'm always jumping to the conclusions. Not long ago, I saw Nicholas Parsons outside a theatre dressed in a leather skirt with fishnet stockings, <laughs> wearing makeup, and I assumed he had just left the stage of the Rocky Horror Show where he had been appearing. But no, in fact, it was just a Friday night and he was out at one of his clubs. <laughs> um, but at school, we used to have a little club called the Jumping to Conclusions Gang. Uh, one person would come to a conclusion and the rest would jump around shortly <laughs> afterwards. This was tremendous fun. Uh, we used to do it throughout break and sometimes into the lunch hour as well, depending on whether anyone had actually reached a conclusion or not. The conclusions were a band I formed in the 16th year of my life and we were particularly good. I played a little bit of bass, some other instruments, if not, it looks like I'm going to do it as well. <laughs> record books are being thrown out of the window. <laughs> We've gone not for two, but now for three rounds. The trouble is it... the show's going to be 15 minutes long. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Tony Hawks went for the full 60 seconds. He's got two points. Clement Freud, you're on something here, aren't you? <laughs> three complete rounds. You've been doing this for a number of years. See if you can create another record. <laughs> uh, the subject is Ballyhoo. So Ballyhoo is a subject, Clement. 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Ballyhoo is an Irish seaside resort <laughs> quite near Ballymena, Ballykinla, Ballyna Hinch, and Ballymatten. I spent many years in the cafe having eggs and bacon and sausage and tomato, which in Ireland is... <coughs> oh, someone's challenged. Yes, Tony. <laughs> what I'm going to say yet. <laughs> it doesn't take many years to eat egg, sausage, bacon and tomato. So what's your challenge? He said he spent many years eating egg, sausage, bacon and tomato. <laughs> He's got to eat quicker. <laughs> Tony, it, it's, a, it's a lovely idea. And we'll give you a bonus point because the audience enjoyed well, the challenge. I not want it, the booers. <laughs> But I did think he conveyed the fact that he spent many years going back there and enjoying that particular breakfast. So, Clement, I think it's an incorrect challenge. You have a point for that. Hang on, the good challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I think he should have it. <laughs> Tony, 
Clement is being very generous, as he is often on this in this show. And Ballyhoo is with you. 41 seconds available, starting now. There is quite a Ballyhoo in my household every time it's bath time. Tantrums, tears, shouting, which is embarrassing, really, because I live alone. <laughs> but I agree with Clement that... Ballyhoo is a small Irish village wedged... Um, Clement Challenge. Not. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a fiction you created before. Right. Clement, a correct challenge. 22 seconds. Starting now. Ballyhoo is a fuss you make, especially if you go to a small Irish village. <laughs> And you don't get a cafe. Uh, um, Tony, your challenge. A repetition of Irish village. Quite right. That's right, yes, you yep. mentioned the Irish village before. So, well, listen, Tony, you... <laughs> you have what a correct challenge. What have I done to upset you in talking? <laughs> They're living every minute of it. And you have 13 seconds to tell us something about Ballyhoo, Tony, starting now. Ballyhoo is the kind of fuss that is caused in an audience in Dorking if someone makes a challenge that they are not fully in agreement with. Even if they have not yet hurt the challenge, they still get out there. They are so aggressive, but I admire them for that. <laughs> so, Tony Hawks with points in that round, including one for speaking as Russell Wendt, has moved forward. He's one point ahead of Sue Perkins, who's in second place, and then Clement Freud and Jeremy Hardy follow, and Sue Perkins, your turn to begin, and the subject is High Summer. Tell us something about High Summer in this game, starting now. High Summer, or the monsoon season, as it's called here in England, <laughs> generally begins in May and extends through to September. During this time, there is an influx of European visitors, namely French, dressed in brightly coloured caggles, who visit some of the greatest sites we have on offer and say, that is very boring, <laughs> to all of them. After this period, we have what is called an Indian summer. That lasts for approximately 30 seconds, during which I <laughs> rush into my garden, lie on a sheet of bako foil, just until my skin reaches boiling point, then I rush in and watch the clouds form. <laughs> After this, there is the great cull, the great luminaries of... Um, Clement Freud, challenge. Yes. Repetition of great. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, uh, correct challenge, Clement. A point to you. And there are 20 seconds available still on high summer starting now. High summer would be a sort of discourteous greeting to Elkie Summer, an actress <laughs> better known for her cleavage than her theatrical skills. And yet, high summer could also refer to the odd bit of sunshine that we get from London to Dorking, all the way to the seaside. Clement Floyd got that point for speaking as a whistle went. He's now equal with Tony Hawks in the lead. And Tony Hawks, it's your turn to begin. The subject, double chins. Tell us something. Everybody in the audience is doing that, putting their heads up immediately. <laughs> double chins, 60 seconds, starting now. I once wrote a song about a double chin called I've Got You Under My Chin. But unfortunately, Cole Porter took the idea, made a tiny alteration, and had a massive hit with it, which was very disappointing to me, I can tell you. Now, the interesting thing about a double chin is that it cannot exist on its own. It has to have the other chin there, otherwise it becomes a single chin and loses its double chin status, which would be upsetting if you were a double chin and wanted to... Uh, Jeremy Challenge. Oh, that's inaccurate, because double chin is a collective term for two chins. You don't know... It's not one of the two chins. It's, it's the both together. It's like a pair of chins. <laughs> You're trying very hard, but it doesn't work. A double chin is a singular. You can use that in the singular. Oh, so. can I? Yes. <laughs> so, Tony... I shall use this knowledge wisely. Uh, uh, 30 seconds, double chin, still with you, Tony. Having got another point, starting now. For some reason, people think it's unsightly to have a double chin. You could go on to have more, a quadruple chin. It doesn't matter. Your appearance is not as important as you think, people of Dork. Ah, uh, Sue Perkins, Sue. Repetition of people. Yes, you said people, yes. And uh, Sue, well, listen, you've got in there with 17 seconds on double chins starting now. The important thing with a double chin is never to talk to a child because small people are much, much, much tinier than you. <laughs> I just 
set myself up for that. Oh, it's a tough game. Clement, so what you... was that? Sorry, what am I being... <laughs> what was the problem there? It's offside. Uh, offside. Nine seconds, Clement. Double chins, starting now. If you have two breasts, it is known as a bosom, and yet a couple of chins don't have a collective term. They are known as a double chin. Clement, boy, speaking again. This is the again. The extra point. He's now moved further ahead. Tony Hawks and Jeremy Hardy. Uh, Tony Hawks second place. Jeremy Hardy two perks. Kins in uh, equal importance. <laughs> and uh, Jeremy Hardy, your turn to begin. And the subject is my worst habit. Tell us something about my worst habit. Starting now. My worst habit would have to be repetition by which I mean saying the same thing over repeatedly and again. <laughs> this might not seem like a cardinal sin or a truly perverse habit, but on this game it's considered worse than bestiality or Satanism, <laughs> which in areas outside Dorset would be considered quite perverse in themselves, but in the west of England are considered field sports, <laughs> along with beating badgers to death with pool cues, and riding around on the backs of the working class. Uh, Clement Floyd challenge. Uh, considered three times. Yes, you did say considered did I? Uh, earlier on. He no. let you go for a bit, but uh, you did repeat the word. And uh, Clement, you got in the 27 seconds available. My worst habit, starting now. My worst habit is one that I bought in an Oxfam shop <laughs> for under 50 pence. It was a special deal and contains sacking and an old silk lining once worn by a titled lady. Um, Tony Hawk's challenge. I want to know how many other habits he's got. <laughs> if that's his worst one. Uh, so just, uh, just, uh, just, just a, a question, query. that was yeah, all. Yeah, just how many other ones have you got? Well, I, he may maybe tell us in just a minute, because you interrupted him, so he gets a point for being interrupted. He continues with the subject. Thirteen seconds, my worst habit, starting now. A compulsion to throw pieces of sweet paper out of the window of my car, regardless of where I am, is an extremely bad habit, which some would think might be my worst. <laughs> he paused, but nobody challenged, and then the whistle went, so he gets the point for speaking. Tony Hawks, your turn to begin. And the subject is barking up the wrong tree. You have 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. For a long time, I never fully understood the logic of this expression because I couldn't grasp the concept that there is actually a right tree to bark up. <laughs> Surely whichever tree you go to to perform this, it's still a waste of time, especially if you're a young man like I am. But then I discovered its origin. In fact, what it is coming from is the raccoon hunting. Uh, hello, Buddha. <laughs> Sue Perkins, you challenge, yes. Just a question, what's a curraccoon? <laughs> well, I've, I've got more than he's got <laughs> habits of them, I tell you. It's a deviation from English as we understand it. So, uh, Sue, you have a correct challenge and you have 33 seconds. Tell us something about barking up the wrong tree, starting now. If it's wrong to bark up the wrong tree, then it's also wrong to <laughs> meow up the wrong uh, tree. Only challenged. Uh, repetition of wrong. You can repeat the words on the card, not necessarily in the phrase, but individually and differently. So, Sue very cleverly did that. Tony didn't know the rules. <laughs> and uh, Sue's got another point and keeps the subject, and there are 29 seconds available. Barking up the wrong tree, starting now. So, the cats are in clover. There they are, meowing up the wrong tree. Um, uh, Clement, you challenge. Repetition of meowing. Yes, Dorking. Yes. Sir Clement is right. Some were listening and heard it, and some were not and didn't hear it. But, uh, Clement, you were correct. You listened. 26 seconds, barking up the wrong tree, starting now. Barking up the wrong tree, or up the wrong tree, barking. Barking tree up. <laughs> wrong tree. All these expressions showing that one has got the wrong end of the stick. Trees have barks, as everyone knows, as do dogs who occasionally bark up the wrong tree because they don't know which the right tree is likely to be. <laughs> Clement Floyd was then speaking as the whistle went and gained that extra point, and he's now moved ahead of Sue Perkins and then Tony Hawks and then Jeremy Hardy in that order. And Sue, it's your turn to begin. The subject now is panel games. 
Tell us something about that in the show starting now. A panel game is generally where four people sit around talking and then Clement Freud wins. <laughs> the first ever panel game took place in the First World War at Bulford Barracks, an unfortunate incident where somebody misunderstood the term quickfire round. <laughs> Women in panel shows are expected to wear bright coloured blazers and not say very much, and in one of those respects, I am the same. As that. <laughs> And also way off grammatically, which is good, but no one has picked up on it, so I carry onwards with my discussion of panel shows. Panel Beating was a great panel show which uh, Jeremy uh, Clarkson hosted in 1979, sadly. It only went to one series and nobody watched it apart from me, which is great because I can talk about it and no one is there to challenge me. Uh, Tony Hawk's challenge. Uh, repetition of no one. No one, yes. It's correct. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm not he, coming to Dorking on tour. <laughs> he plays by the rules. Let her get away with a couple of hesitations, so he comes in on a correct challenge of repetition and 13 seconds available on panel games with you, Tony, starting now. I came up with a panel game once called That's My Beard, in which five bearded men came on, shaved off their... Uh, Jeremy Hardy challenge. He came twice. <laughs> Which I'm not knocking at all. No, it was not possible on just a minute because it's repetition. And there uh, are six seconds available panel games with you, Jeremy, starting now. Start the week is a bit like a panel game with all the rules taken away and no joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty equal with the points and even in the contributions, but... Clement Foy is just in the lead ahead of Tony Hawks and Sue Perkins and then Jeremy Hardy in that order. And Jeremy, your turn to begin the subject, parasites. Tell us something about parasites in just a minute, starting now. There is a huge family of parasites, so big it requires many palaces and castles to accommodate all of them. <laughs> but there are, of course, other parasites. There is the ringworm, there is the theatre critic, and uh, Clement Foy, your challenge. Uh, repetition of there is. There is, yes. Fair play. And I didn't like what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the audience did either. <laughs> Middle England rebelled. <laughs> and, but Clement, you got him at the correct challenge of there is. 45 seconds available, parasites starting now. The parasites was probably the bravest regiment the army has ever seen. <laughs> Replete with battle honours, medals, fights in which they defeated the enemy. And I wanted, when I joined the army, to join. I said join. Yeah. <laughs> Tony got in first. A uh, repetition of join. Yes, mm. Tony, you got parasites. I'm sorry you haven't got parasites. Have you? <laughs> I thought, it's I out thought of the I open. was itching. Yeah. I, I apologise, Tony. Now that means I have... The audience, I don't know why the audience enjoyed it so much. I don't know whether they... It is an image you project which we don't know about. Anyway, um... 28 seconds are available for you to talk on parasites, Tony, starting now. As far as I know, parasites are ugly little organisms which live off the organs of other creatures, not really contributing anything themselves to the well-being of the world. Hence, they've become rather unpopular. Certainly in our social parlance, when we use the word parasites, we're not paying compliments. I wouldn't really know who the social parasites are, and it's a very controversial area. Heaven knows there was nearly a big... Tony Hawks speaking as the whistle went gain that extra point and with other points in the round let's move forward he's now only one point behind our leader who is still Clement Freud and Tony your turn to begin the subject a chip off the old block can you tell us something about a chip off the old block starting now I suppose if you are a chip off the old block you are supposed to be like your parents yet my father was in the merchant navy and my mother was a tiller girl now, I would need to be a dancing sailor, really, <laughs> to be a chip off the old block. And I will be doing an act similar to that in Dorking in about a month's time. <laughs> if any of you here would be interested in coming along, you can boo me in the same way as you did some of my challenges 
earlier on. And that time it really will deserve it, because the performance will be abysmal, I have to tell you. But I used to have a block in my back garden that I used to chip away at for no reason, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Jeremy Hardy challenged. Hesitation. It was a hesitation. So, you have the subject, which is uh, a chip off the old block, and you have 18 seconds starting now. There is a discussion as to whether things are hereditary or environmental. Most things, I believe, are a consequence of time and place. You can inherit male pattern baldness from your mother's father, but not a tendency to fight in the First World War. <laughs> Unless certain conditions are in place, you will not simply replicate the activity. So Jeremy Hardy, speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point, and he's now equal with Sue Perkins in third place. But they are only just two points behind Tony Hawks, who is three points behind Clement Freud. So Clement Freud, we say, you are the winner this week. <laughs> so it only remains for me to say thank you to the four exciting and talented players of the game, Sue Perkins, Clement Freud, Jeremy Hardy and Tony Hawks. Also thank... Uh, Jenny Staplehurst, who's helped me with a score and blown her whistle so delicately. We are also indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this game that we enjoy playing so much. And, of course, we are deeply indebted to our producer, Claire Jones, for her production and also her direction. But we are even more indebted to this lovely audience here in Dorking, <laughs> who have it thrilled us and moved us on our way with Eclat. A lovely, warm Surrey audience from them, from the panel, from me, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you for tuning in. Be with us the next time we play Just a Minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners in this country, around the world, and also to welcome the four exciting, talented performers who this week are going to play in Just a Minute. And we welcome back with great pleasure the exceptional humour of Paul Merton, the witty humour of Clement Freud, the clever humour of Tim Rice, and the delightful humour of Annabelle Giles. And will you welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score and blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And as usual, I'm going to ask our players of the game to speak for 60 seconds if they can on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject which is on the card in front of me. And in, we are doing this particular edition of Just a Minute from the Swan Theatre in High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire. We begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject is chopsticks. Tell us something about chopsticks in just a minute, starting now. If you were to leave a lamb cutlet for too long in a frying pan, <laughs> it could be well be called chopsticks, <laughs> as are the implements... A Paul Merton challenge. Well, it might be called that, but it'd be wrong. <laughs> you, can't, you can't say that's a chopsticks. What's the, where's the English there? The mm. chopsticks. <laughs> Uh, nonsense. Uh, no, I know, but, but uh, we, we allowed a little bit of fantasy in this game, and you show... Uh, Why is that fantasy? Well, <laughs> fact as well. You have justified your, uh, your what you said, Clement, and Paul's uh, challenge was incorrect. So Clement gets a point for an incorrect challenge. He keeps the subject, and there are 50 seconds available starting now. If you go to an Indian restaurant and ask... Uh, Annabelle, challenge. I know this is really picky, but I'm sort of learning fast. He said if twice. <laughs> <laughs> the well, first bit he started with had started yes, with well, if you, and then and that's why you, you, you don't have just is that I, naughty I, I, though? No, no. So is that you, too picky though? Generally? No, 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 no. Not with Clement Freud. He's been playing the game for fifty years. Yes, it's I mean, ridiculous. Yeah. 
Um, you have I can't subject. help but feel you'll live to regret it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, if this was television, there'd be looks where the camera would be jumping between the faces now. Right, um, you have a, correct, a point for a correct challenge, Annabelle, and you take over the subject of chopsticks, and there are 47 seconds available starting now. Chopsticks, to me, is a piece on a piano, uh, probably invented... <laughs> yes, I know, uh, what is the Poor challenge. There was an R. Yes, yes, which we interpret as hesitation. That's, that's hesitation. You're yes. absolutely so, Paul, absolutely let's hear from you on chopsticks. You've got a point for a correct challenge. You have 43 seconds starting now. But if the Chinese a minute be so clever, why aren't they using cutlery? That's what I seem to think, <laughs> because it's so much easier. When I go into a restaurant and I order all kinds of different delicacies from the menu, I want to eat it with a knife and fork, because I'm no good with chopsticks. Two bits of wood, do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it, nice. I'm speechless. Yeah. <laughs> Speechless with anger, Nicholas. I know, I know. It was shown in your face and was registered, but the audience got the mood, and I'm sure the listeners did as well. Um, Tim, you have a correct challenge. You have a point for that, of course. 26 seconds are available. The subjects, chopsticks, starting now. Chopsticks, as the beautiful woman on my right, Annabelle, for those of you who are not watching but merely listening to this program, is best known to many people. The word conjures up a piece of music a wonderfully simple thing on the piano, which you start by bashing at the notes F and G and gradually move out. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you challenge. Very, very slight hesitation. Uh, yes. I was, right. I was illustrating the gradualness of it. Uh, it, was, it was a sort of... very well. Uh, yes, yes. I, uh, thank you. Seven seconds are available, uh, Paul, for you to, con I mean, to take over the subject of chopsticks starting now. I remember my family used to sit around the piano wishing to God that one of us could play it. Every Saturday night we used to play chopsticks on it. Um, Clement, you challenged. We have to play it. You did play it. I know, yeah. I, was thought, I thought the whistle would go before then. Yeah. <laughs> Clement's clever got in with one second to go. Oh. On chopsticks starting now. No. Uh, who challenged? Paul. <laughs> Hesitation, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> Give him a bonus point, but Clement was interrupted. He has got three quarters of a second on chopsticks starting now. <laughs> so, whoever is speaking as the whistle goes in this game gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Clement Freud, so he's equal in the lead with Paul Merton uh, at the end of their round. Annabel Giles and Tim Bryce are also equal in second place. And, Tim, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the bee's knees. Tell us something about bees knees starting now. I'd like to talk about bees knees in five different sections. The first part is the actual anatomy of the insect in question. Many people do not realize that the only living creature on this wonderful planet of ours that has four knees is the elephant. The bee, on the other hand, only has a couple, even though it has more than two legs. Its knees are very, very important as it... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know. It's a difficult... You were going so well and so interestingly, but it is a difficult game. Very, very clement. You were the first. Six, 36 seconds available. Tell us something about the bee's knees starting now. A Patagonian came up to me and said, What is your bee's knees? And it took me a while... <laughs> To realise what oh, it wait, was. Uh, Clement, actually, Tim Rice challenged, right? Well, it was very unsupporting, but he was trying to milk the applause. No, was <laughs> no, 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 to be found this occasion. No, no, this occasion, the laughter no, was, was so loud. loud. He was riding it. I mean, you, yes. you couldn't. He wasn't milking it. That means you were having to build it up. It wasn't. It was spontaneous. So, Clement, I don't allow it. And you have another point for an incorrect challenge. And you have 29 seconds on the bee's knees starting now. I told him that I was a cook and at one time ran a tobacconist shop and found that he had no idea what he was about, as I have not. Bees have more than two knees, and I think Tim Rice is absolutely wrong in that every leg which is attached to a bee has about it an ankle, a knee, a cuff, and a thigh. <laughs> Paul Challenge. I don't know. I've led a sheltered life. <laughs> I don't think bees have thighs. No? <laughs> And they don't have I don't calves think they have ankles either. either. They, they might have calves, but they definitely haven't got thighs. They, they, well, I don't think they've got calves either, but anyway, no, no they don't have those muscles, no. No. Um, they, they, <laughs> legs are little stick-like things. So, Paul, a correct challenge. Six seconds. The bee's knees starting now. I love to dress bees up in all kinds of stockings and beautiful suspenders to show off their wonderful thighs and their calves. <laughs> 
Paul Merton got the point for speaking as the whistle went then. He's still equal in the lead with Clement Freud. And Annabel Giles and Tim Rice are still equal in second place. Annabel, it's your turn to begin. The subject is mummies. Tell us something about mummies in this game, starting now. Good mummies, to me, strike me as ladies with lots of lovely big bosoms and nice hips and baggy jumpers and leggings who, when they clasp their children, their children... Oh, for goodness oh, no, sake! <laughs> Tim, your correct challenge. Mummies yes. is with you. 52 seconds, starting now. Mummies are what the Egyptian kings became after they passed away and shuffled off this mortal coil. Their subjects, weeping, moaning, crying, desolate in their sadness and despair, would take the corpse, the stiff, and shove it down a pyramid. <laughs> where it was a very sad occasion, this, and not one that should inspire laughter in any but the most disgustingly minded of audiences. I find it very hard to continue with such a moving theme. Uh, a challenge. Deviation from the subject. Yes. He's now gone off the subject of mummies and you're talking about this audience here. And they don't look like mummies to me. They're, they're very much alive. Mm. And uh, so, Clement, a correct challenge, a point, of course. Uh, mummies is with you, 23 seconds starting now. Many children have found to their costs that if daddies get it wrong, they end up with mummies also step mummies and other mummies from children of other people. <laughs> <laughs> Nurse! <laughs> so, um, uh, Tim, you challenge first, yes. Hesitation. 13 seconds, mummies starting now. Mummies are very important in every child's life. Perhaps it is the very first being that... Um, Tim, a challenge. Deviation. Why? I think a mummy is important to any child's life. I think he was speaking collectively and saying that mummies are important in children's lives. It's a plural he was using. No, I don't think he was deviating from that. that was the more to... mummies children have, the less important they become. <laughs> <laughs> A shrewd observation. That was for an extra point. You know, no. <laughs> All right, give him an extra point. He's desperate to have one. Is that, and... is that a new rule? We can get a point just by asking for one. <laughs> uh, seven seconds, Tim, on uh, Mummy's incorrect challenge, starting now. Come with me down the River Nile, whose limp... Uh, Paul's challenge. Well, it's not very convenient, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, can't, I can't just drop everything and say, OK, let's go down the River Nile. <laughs> right, he wants his bonus point. He's got it, Paul <laughs> Burton. <laughs> And Tim, you were interrupted, so you get a point for that, and you have five seconds on mummies starting now. Come with me to the front foyer of the oh, swamp. Uh, oh, He's repeated the phrase, come, come with, with me. me. Yes. Oh. It's it's, it's, once you lose your it's flow, a it often... It's it, awkward, yes. Yes, it often, the flow doesn't come back. Right, three seconds, uh, mummies with you, Paul, starting now. Tutankhamun is perhaps the most famous... <laughs> Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went again. That extra point is one ahead of Clement Freud at the end of the round. And Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject now is the secret of good relationship. Oh, oh sorry, I read it wrong. The secret of a good relationship. Uh, 60 seconds starting now. The secret of a good relationship is to respect the other person's point of view, listen to what they've got to say, then make them agree with you. <laughs> it's the only way forward. Other people's opinions are an awful bore. Um, uh, Tim Challenge. Two others. Two uh, others, mm -hmm. yes. Right, 49 seconds are available for you, Tim, having got another point to take over. The secret of a good relationship starting now. The secret of a good relationship is lust. Passion. <laughs> Sweaty... Uh, Clement Challenge. <laughs> Hesitation. No, he didn't it's hesitate. Not... No, no. Clement, he... why did you have the challenge at that point? <laughs> <laughs> he was playing the audience. He had us all on tenterhooks. And, no, no, he, he didn't. Uh, he didn't. Well, he had it in the palm of his hand. I know he definitely did. <laughs> Tim, an incorrect challenge. You have 44 seconds on the secret of a good relationship starting now. The secret of a good relationship is celibacy. It is absolutely <laughs> fatal to go anywhere near somebody with whom you wish to have a good relationship because once you get into all that groping and cuddling, it all goes out the window and that relationship is... Uh, Paul Challenge. It all goes out the window? <laughs> this, yes. is, this is deviation. I've never... <laughs> I've, I've never done any cuddling that's ended up going out of the window. 
It's a, it's a very amusing thought that you've got, but he was using it as a, as a phrase, which is a common uh, cliché, things going out the window, and I don't think he was deviating from the subject of the secret of a good relationship. But Paul, right, they enjoyed your remark. Give him another one. And, um, <laughs> but, but Tim was interrupted. He gets a point. He has the secret of a good relationship, and there are 30 seconds starting now. If you wish to have a good relationship with your fellow artist or panellist, don't keep interrupting him with fatuous challenges. <laughs> Uh, Paul Chalmers. <laughs> I, I had to. <laughs> so, what is a challenge? Well, I disagree. I think it is good to interrupt and challenge. No, I just knew it would get a laugh if I pressed the button, but so it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an incorrect challenge. An incorrect challenge. Tim, you have another point. You have the secret of a good relationship. 24 seconds starting now. It's very important if you wish to have a good relationship with your partner to wear the same colour underwear. Uh, Annabelle Gallant. Uh, this is quite picky, but I feel the need. Um, partner. You You're said the... partner lots, actually, now. Hasn't it? Yes, I have. Yes, yes. 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 He has said... Yes, I've tried! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's not... <laughs> That's an unkind and unspeakable so thing, no, but I have got no points yet. I can see the school sheet from here and you I've got none. You have got points. I've got one, have I? No, no, you've got two. Oh, well, I should... <laughs> And you've I now got a third one. Then. You've got a third I've one now. I've got three now. And you've got three oh, now. Oh, well, I'll retire. Yes. <laughs> and you have 20 seconds now to tell us something about the secret of a good relationship starting now. The secret of a good relationship is not to have one at all. After all, who wants some smelly bloke on your sofa with a remote control deciding what you watch on TV and snoring all night long keeping you awake? The secret of a good relationship is to what? Clement, who's <laughs> on? <laughs> three alls. Oh, did I say all lots? Oh. No, no, I love you for that. If you might remember, this started with two ifs. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's a fair cop. <laughs> Seven seconds, Clement. The secret of a good relationship starting now. The whole point of a secret of a good relationship is that no one should know about it, otherwise it would no longer be a secret. <laughs> So, an interesting situation, as Clement Freud got that extra point, speaking of the whistle wind. He's now equal in the lead with Paul Merton, and they're only one ahead of Tim Rice and a few ahead of Annabelle <laughs> Giles. No, 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 she's not far behind. Oh, about five, that's all, there's not many. <laughs> Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject now is bucks. Tell us something about bucks in this game, starting now. Bucks is the popular name for the county of Buckinghamshire, which is north of the city of London, and bounded by Middlesex, Northamptonshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire, and probably other counties whose name I can now remember. Amersham is the jewel of Buckingham's bucks. Uh, Tim, uh, you challenged. Two Buckinghamshires. Yes, because oh, somebody is bucks, and he mentioned yeah. Buckinghamshire. Well, I stopped. Him. And um, 39 seconds on bucks with you, Tim, starting now. I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you at length about bucks, because I was born in Buckinghamshire. This is true. In fact, I was created in the... <laughs> Clement Freud, you challenge first. <laughs> yes, indeed. You've got bucks back. You have 29 seconds starting now. It should not be forgotten that Newport Pagnell is in Bucks, <laughs> as is Olney, where they have annual pancake races, great events in which people take these confections made of flour, milk and eggs in a pan down a street, tossing them as they go. Uh, Paul Charles. Uh, natural stop. Hesitation. That's right, your hesitation. Ten seconds, Paul. You tell us something about bucks starting now. Well, bucks is also a term for sexually active young men, and there's nothing I like better than doing it wrong out of the window. It's the people downstairs I feel sorry for, because they're having their tea, and suddenly it goes right! <laughs> so, Paul Merton speaks with us again. The next point is now one ahead of Clement Freud, and then Tim Rice, one behind them. And, Tim, your turn to begin. The subject, Monday mornings... Tell us something about Monday mornings starting now. Monday mornings for me are extremely important. They are the most dynamic moment of my week. I get up every Monday morning with a determination to do even better than I did on Sunday, which in my case is not very difficult, as most of the holy day of each week for me has been an absolute disaster for the last 35 years. Therefore, every Monday morning I think now is the opportunity I have to make good, to do 
Uh, Annabel Chance. Yes, he said morning twice, and in the title it says mornings. Mm. Well, listen, Annabel, he did say morning twice. Yeah. And the subject is Monday oh. morning. I'm so sorry, you're doing so well. I was, I uh, what I want to know is what, what happens on Sundays that's so awful. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go into oh, it. Oh, really? Can we have a... Can the next one be Sunday mornings, please? <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you want Tim to start with it to find out. Yeah, <clears throat> Annabelle, you have a correct really? challenge. You have 33 oh. seconds. You tell us something about Monday mornings starting now. Now, you see, I rather enjoy Monday mornings because that's my day off. A long time ago, I realised I really dreaded Monday mornings coming up, and so I decided that I would work very hard on a Sunday instead and take... <laughs> Uh, Tim challenge. Two Sundays. No, she no, hasn't said Sunday. No, I said Sunday. No. Ooh, no. wrong! <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't said Sunday yet, Tim. Oh, oh, oh I said it, didn't I? No, no. Yes, it was you. Yes. <laughs> she I said it's a very difficult game. Sunday. She said Sunday when she was talking before she started right. on the yes, game. Yes, it was bizarre. Yes, right, sorry. it was bizarre. No, right, uh, so Annabelle, oh, an incorrect challenge. You've still anything. got the subject, you've got another point. And you keep going, you've 22 seconds available, Monday mornings starting now. So this Monday, for example, I decided to tidy my bedroom, because that's what I really enjoy doing. Get everything ordered. If you have a neat bedroom, you have an organised mind. Uh, oh, who challenge. now? What? <laughs> It was two bedrooms. She, oh, was it? Oh, thank you. you, you Dash, bit, I really had enough you now. You dropped a bit, a bit too long on the bedroom, I'm afraid, <laughs> Annabelle. Yes. Monday mornings, Paul, 15 seconds, starting now. Bob Geldof and the... Who? Who? It's um, Bill Geldof. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the challenge, Tim? Um, error, deviation. I Bob, Bob Geldof. I think he was... I'm not, no, not Bob, Bob Geldof. <laughs> happens to be a very good friend of mine. <laughs> is it? Although I now see what you're saying, there is a similarity in the names. <laughs> How can I judge on that? Because I, I agree with you, I, I, I'm certainly but was going to say Bob Geldof. He stumbled with emotion. He did stumble, but I, I mean, he could well friend. say he was going to talk about Bob Geldof, and he, yeah. he, he didn't hesitate. No. So I must say, within the rules of just a minute, <laughs> To be completely fair, I must say, uh, an incorrect challenge. 13 seconds, Monday mornings with you, uh, uh, Paul, starting now. He was a big fan of the pop single, I Don't Like Mondays, which was an enormous hit sometime, I believe, in the early 80s, based on a true and sad case of a pupil who went to school on a Monday morning. <laughs> so, Paul Merton speaking as a whistle went, with other points, the round has taken the lead now. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject... A Mexican wave. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. By virtue of the fact that Mexico has coastlines to the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean, a Mexican wave... <laughs> oh, I think we're in the world of spoonerisms yeah, here. Yeah. A Mexican wave. <laughs> I think that's deviation from English, if we understand it. And uh, 50 seconds for you, Paul, on a Mexican wave starting now. It's called a Mexican wave because it did originate in Mexico during a particularly dull football game. The crowd got it into their heads to suddenly do this wave around the stadium by standing up the person next to them would do the same thing and it would carry on around the arena. Uh, Annabelle challenged. Do this wave, do the same thing. Do the same thing, do oh. the same thing, yes. Mm -hmm. So you got in on a Mexican wave and there are 36 seconds available starting now. If a Mexican was to wave to me, he would probably be saying, you want to see a postcard of my sister? But I think I'd probably... Uh. <laughs> Tim Rice challenge, why Tim? Well, I thought there was some hesitation, but maybe no, I'm wrong. No, 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 no. no you have She hesitated because of what that a Mexican said to her. Yes, yeah. right. don't blame her. No, an incorrect challenge. I think I'm leaving space for the question mark, yes, I sorry. think that's what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. You've got 30 seconds. A Mexican wave starting now. A Mexican wave could occur on the beach of Acapulco, as that is, I believe, a sandy resort of the... Uh, yes. Yeah, Clement for a challenge. It's much appreciated, Clement. Thank you. Right. 24 <laughs> seconds. A Mexican wave, Clement, with you starting now. In Acapulco, there are Mexican waves that come from the sea to the beach. And I'm sorry I said Atlantic it's before, because Tim I Rice was wrong. Challenge you. Well, I thought it was hesitation, but more importantly, I think we had C before from Cameron, didn't no, we? Don't know. No, 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 we didn't. We didn't know well, you named them, but I don't think he said C. He named it, yes. Talked about the oceans, I think. 18 seconds. With you, Clement, still on a Mexican wave starting now. When you leave the city of the country from which Mexican waves originate, 
people take out their handkerchiefs and unfold them, waving them for goodbye, hello, I've got a headache, <laughs> where's the nearest chemist? Uh, well, John, I don't think this is a good system. <laughs> If one wave means hello, goodbye, where's the nearest chemist? No wonder they're always having revolutions. <laughs> you might be seeing your mother-in-law off the train waving. She thinks, why, why does he want to know where the nearest chemist is? I do think what he was saying was deviating from what a Mexican wave is. Absolutely. No, no, you can't wave. No, no, what no. a Mexican waving is deviation from a Mexican wave. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, <laughs> You got the benefit of the doubt last time, Clement, so Paul will have it on this occasion. Two seconds ago, a Mexican wave starting now. A Peruvian gesture is a bit like a Mexican wave. So, at the end of that round, uh, Paul Merton has increased his lead ahead of Clement Freud and then Tim Rice and Annabelle does in that order. Not many points to separate right. any of them. We're moving into the final round, and uh, it's Tim Rice's turn to begin, and the subject is aardvarks. <laughs> So, Tim, tell us something about aardvark in this game starting now. Aardvark is one of the first words in the dictionary. It is also a South African anteater, a furry beast, which, strangely enough, eats ants. Aardvark, to me, means something very moving, because the first pop group I was ever in had that name. We were called the Aardvarks because it meant we were always top of any alphabetical bill. We would have been ahead even of ABBA, even Aaron... Uh, Glamour for challenge. Well, we're not of... A... Repetitions, but even was even the, even was the one that stood out. Right. right. No, they all stood out. I <laughs> Clement, you have a direct challenge. You have thirty-eight seconds. You don't have to rub it in all the time. Thirty-eight <laughs> seconds. Aardvarks starting now. An aardvark is a sort of ant eater who lives. Um, Tim Rice challenge. It, it's not a sort of ant eater. It is an ant. It is an ant eater. Yeah. <laughs> it's a sort of. It's an ant. 100% bona fide anteater. It's nothing. <laughs> it is not a I bus, you, it Tim, is not a right. cabbage, it is an anteater. They'll argue over the slightest interpretation, but that is a correct comment, Tim, and you have the subject back of aardvarks, 35 seconds starting now. Aardvarks are very homely creatures. They are very proud of their sets. Uh, Paul Challenge. Two berries, I'm afraid. Two berries, uh, yes. So, Paul, you were going to hear from you on aardvarks with 32 seconds to go starting now. Aardvarks are a different breed to softvarks. <laughs> Aardvarks are the people come towards you. Here, who are you looking at? You're not in a bit of trouble. You've got any ants on, you know what I mean? Whereas the other kind that I mentioned earlier is more likely to curl uh, up. Clement Freud challenge. <laughs> Five views. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be a little bit you, 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 you want to do this, you want to do that, yes. So, Clement and the correct challenge, and you have 22 seconds to tell us anything about aardvarks starting now. If you order one in a restaurant, I suggest that underdone or a point is better than blue. I think... Uh, Paul, well, I don't know. He could be making up words. I've no idea. <laughs> I think you've all got so many points, and with a piece of quiet and harmony, uh, Paul, I'm going to allow you to continue for the last 12 seconds on aardvarks, starting now. The only way to hypnotise an aardvark with any degree of success is to get hold of a... <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you challenge. You see, you've lost it right Hesitation. away. Hesitation. Hesitation, right. Two seconds on aardvarks with you, Tim, starting now. They only come out at night, these aardvark creature things. <laughs> so that brings the show to an end with a huge climax. They all spoke on aardvarks in that round. We enjoyed the contribution of every one of them. Annabel Giles coming back for a second time, did extremely well, got three times more points than she got the first time. <laughs> Tim Rice, returning to the Swan, his place of triumph, did extremely well, finished in third place, but he got uh, four times as many points as he did last time. <laughs> Clement Freud, who did very well last time with the Swan at Wickham, got twice as many. And Paul Merton didn't get quite so many, but he still got four more than Clement Freud. So once again, we say, Paul Merton, you are the winner this week. <laughs> it only remains for me to say thank you to our four outstanding players of the game, Paul Merton, Clement Freud, Tim Rice and Annabelle Giles. I thank Janice Staplehurst for helping with the score and blowing her whistle. We are indebted to our producer, Claire Jones, who keeps us all in order and suffers our eccentric behaviour. And also we're indebted 
to Ian Messeter, who created this game. But particularly, we are indebted to this lovely audience here at the Swan Theatre in High Wycombe. From them, from the panellists, from me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye. Tune in the next time we play Just a Minute. <laughs> And as the minute walls fade away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, but throughout the world, but also to welcome the four exciting, dynamic and diverse personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back three who played it with great skill in the past, that is Paul Merton, Graham Norton and Clement Freud, and someone who's never played the game before, that is Ross Noble. Would you please welcome all four of them? As usual... I am going to ask them to speak, if they can, on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And uh, beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep the score, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the presence, the festival fringe. And we have before us an excited, <laughs> rather overexcited, I think. <laughs> festival fringe audience who are now going to enjoy themselves as we start the show with Paul Merton and subject for the starting of this show is very apt. It is the fringe. So Paul, will you speak on the fringe in just a minute starting now? The fringe, the fringe, the fringe. What a wonderful place to be here in Edinburgh at this time of year when everybody from all over the world, people who have no talent, people who are <laughs> two people. <laughs> Clem and Freud challenge. Uh, repetition of people. Yeah, there were too many people, I'm sorry. There are too many people sometimes at the fringe, but it doesn't matter. It's exciting, and that's what it's about. There are 48 seconds still available. Clement Freud gets a point for a correct challenge. He takes over the subject, the fringe, starting now. It would be trichologically demanding for me to grow a fringe <laughs> in view of the amount of hair which I have not got. Um, there is a peripheral production of Oklahoma in the Edinburgh Fringe, in which there's an excellent description of a caney as a soiree with a binge on top. <laughs> uh, Paul Martin, you've challenged. Hesitation. Stop. Indeed, there was hesitation. He, he made his joke, got his laugh, and thought, that's enough for me. Get so, uh, <laughs> going home now. Are you off now, then, Clement? <laughs> 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 nice of you to come down from London. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Paul, a correct challenge. Uh, Ross, you've challenged. Yeah, surely you came up from London. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can't have that sort of deviation here. Oh, OK. But it was nice to hear from you, Sorry. Ross. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to buzz in again and say I'm very excited to be here. I know, but... <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is a first for you. First time you've spoken on just a minute. Yeah, so it is, yeah. It's, wonderful, it's a shame it wasn't. We weren't actually playing the game. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter as long as they hear from you. Okay. As long as you're getting the response, that's what it's all about. Um, right, Paul, you had a correct challenge, and you get a point for that, of course, and you have 22 seconds available for The Fringe starting now. When I first came to the Edinburgh Fringe, it was 1980. Uh, Graham Norton challenge. Uh, repetition of Edinburgh. Yes, he mentioned oh. Edinburgh before. Yes, you did. <laughs> and you can't mention I it. I feel in... a fool. <laughs> <laughs> That is you, isn't it, Clement? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, listen, uh, Graham. So you got the subject of the film. Very fringe. harsh, I thought. Very no, he was. Harsh. I feel, I feel petty. Uh, I, no. <laughs> no I, then let it spoil the show for you. Graham, <laughs> it is still a correct challenge and a point to you. And 19 seconds available, the fringe starting now. In America, the fringe is referred to as bangs. This is because in that country everything is bigger as we know and thus people with a fringe constantly walk into things. <laughs> there are restaurants with fringe and no fringe sections because... <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point and on this occasion it was Graham Norton and at the end of the round you won't be surprised to hear that Graham Norton's in the lead uh, he's two ahead of Paul Merton and Clement Freud and Ross Noble <laughs> no no because I think they are really surprised to hear that <laughs> Graham 
Could you yes. take the next round? All right. The subject is first impressions. Give us something about first impressions in just a minute, starting now. The first impression dates back to Stone Age times, when someone molded a sort of beret thing out of scraps of mammoth fur, put it on his head, turned to his waiting family, and said, Oh, Betty. <laughs> Sadly... It didn't go that well, as it would be many centuries before Frank Spencer actually made it into the popular psyche. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. I'm sure someone will tell me if it isn't. First, uh, Paul Merton challenge. It is. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> It is how you say it. Yeah, yeah. Have you a challenge within the rules of No, I just, just, Graham wasn't sure. No, I wasn't sure. Right. <laughs> now, we have listeners all over the world who learn English, as we know, from this programme. I know, and I, <laughs> I mention that regularly. Yeah. And, uh, you get comes, letters, don't you, Nick? I get letters. Yes. I talk about the letters, so as to give you... <laughs> but despite that, you're still here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, the audience enjoyed your interruption. You get a bonus point for that. Graham was interrupted, so he gets a point for being interrupted, and he keeps the subject, and he has 26 seconds to continue with first impressions <laughs> starting now. The first impressions I ever made were too dense at the bottom of our stairs, where I tripped while carrying a coffee mug. I was only four. My mother shouldn't have let me. It was dangerous. And sure enough, I did fall, and crushing through a sort of chalkboard, you know, the sort of thing, not a sturdy wall. Yes, Ross, you press your buzzer. Yeah, did he say fall twice? He did. Did say Paul yes. Price, right? oh. <laughs> well, listen, you Yes, I'm like glad I was way. listening to that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was on the case there. Sharp, sharp, yeah. right. Well, I wasn't sure whether it was two falls or whether or not we just had to remind people that fall is the right way to say fall in case they were listening in Peru. <laughs> No, they will. I mean, they'll all come back talking with Geordie accents if it isn't to you long enough. But, okay. Uh, well, anyway. I'm actually from Northumberland. I'd just like to point that out. I'm slightly posh. Is there a difference between the Northumberland accent and the Tyne of Weir accent? Very much so. People in Northumberland tend to... <laughs> so they sound like they're drunk at all right. times. Are they drunk all the time? Yeah, pretty much. I thought there was a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought it was people in Newcastle yeah, were drunk that's, all the that's how I got on this show. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now try and talk about first impressions, because you have a point for a correct challenge. You have 11 seconds starting now. What if... And someone's challenge your... Da-da! Da. Yes. yes, it is. You rotten... <laughs> I cannot believe, having just said that people from Northumberland roll their R's, I was just going oh, into the words, <laughs> and that wasn't linguistically taken into account. I think, <laughs> I think he was actually uh, professionally being rather generous so that you get another point, which you've got, because you hadn't hardly gone for a second. Ten seconds, first impression, still with you, uh, Ross, starting now. One example of making a bad impression is turning up to a project. <laughs> Clement Floyd, you challenge us take. Yes. Hesitation. That's we call that hesitation. No, no, that's, oh, that's, no, no, no. That's that, a Northumberland accent. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was yeah. yeah. Clement, you have a correct challenge. You have five seconds. First impression starting now. Can I fit? Hang on, he definitely, he definitely hesitated there. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Wasted on your own petard. Right, he was interrupted. Clement, you have another point because you're interrupted and you have uh, five and a half seconds. First impression starting now. My first impression was of a chicken going into a farmyard backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, may, Clement, I, Troy, may, may I just continue? Can you finish the sentence then? Do doodle cocker. <laughs> It's what I call lingering applause. I don't know whether they should be clapping or not, but for the point for speaking, as the whistle went, and at the end of the round, you've now taken the lead equal with Graham Norton and followed by the other two equal in second place. And, Ross and Noble, your turn to begin. The subject, moles. Can you tell us something about moles in this game, starting now? Moles would have to be the finest of all the country animals digging away beneath the ground. Not many people realise this, but moles are in fact the natural enemy of wombles. As they move around beneath the surface of... Surface of... Uh, <laughs> it's a difficult game, isn't it? Right, so uh, I'm just stopping the word surface. Yes. It's yeah. just going on so, a long yeah. time. <laughs> 
we interpret that as hesitation. Graham, you got the subject of moles, and there are 46 seconds available starting now. The difference between moles and freckles is that moles are enigmatic, sophisticated, strangely beautiful in a sort of exotic way, whereas the other skin thing are just a bit common and have a whiff of ginger about them. I can't approve. Moles are dusky. I have to say, I'm covered in the things. And I went to the doctor to say, are my moles evil? And he couldn't answer me. Uh, uh, Paul Merton Chad. Yeah, hesitation, sadly. You said a definite uh there. Yes. And so moles is over to you, Paul. And you got him with 15 seconds to go, starting now. Well, moles, of course, are very dependable. Uh, Clement Freud challenged. I think there was a hesitation. Do you? I do oh. indeed. <laughs> Once you didn't get going with your usual flourish, you mm. just... Hesit- I'm getting older. <laughs> it's one of those difficult interpretations, but the benefit of the doubt goes to Clement Freud, so he has moles and 11 seconds starting now. When I left Dubrovnik, they said, disappear, go to England, spend 35 years doing just a minute, and then when we have need of someone, we will call you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clement Foy again speaking as the whistle went again that extra point. He's now one ahead of Graham Norton in second place and then Paul Merton and Ross Noble in that order. And Clement, your turn to begin. And the subject is a good rule of thumb. Tell us something about that subject in this game starting now. A good rule of thumb when you go to a restaurant to which you haven't frequently gone is to call the head waiter and say, everything is disgusting, you should be ashamed of yourself, sack the chef and go away and put talcum powder under your arms. (laughs) (laughs) And pull that (laughs) (laughs) That's the ravings of a lunatic. (laughs) That's nice. Do we want people from Peru coming over here, (laughs) complaining to heads and sticking talcum powder under their arms? Not at all, no. 42 seconds available for you, uh, Paul, on a good rule of thumb starting now. King Thumb, of course, was a very popular monarch sometime in the late 17th century in Norway. And people used to love his reign because he would... Be very nice and kind and would say, today is going to be sunshine, followed by scattered showers. In many ways, he was the first weatherman. (laughs) And people would swarm and listen to his wise words. He would stand at the top of his castle, survey his kingdom in front of him and say, I speak to you now as your ruler. I am the (laughs) almighty... Ross Challen. Did he say I twice? Yes, I, and he emphasised the I. Oh, well... A minute ago you were rooting for him, and now you're rooting for Paul. You can't be as fickle as that. I think. Uh, it was. He emphasised the I, and uh, therefore. Well, he was then... the king, wasn't he? Yes. Know. Yeah, no. But you said we. Within, yeah. within, within the. Oh, yeah. Yes, you should have used the word. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, I, I tell you the truth, I made it up anyway. <laughs> uh, there's no king thumb in Norway in the 17th century. You look it up, but you won't find him. Must within the rules of just a minute. I repeated repeat. a vowel sound, and that's good enough for me. <laughs> you repeated I, the first person singular, and uh, Ross got in first. Thirteen seconds for you, Ross. A good rule of thumb, starting now. A good rule of thumb is if it don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Which uh, Paul Merton challenge. Uh, two don'ts, which is a longer word than I. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't rub it in, you <laughs> thing. Worn right. out. Yeah. Anyway, you've got the subject back. You've got nine seconds, Paul. A good rule of thumb, starting now. My thumb measures, I would say, about two and a half inches. And if I was looking to find that particular measurement on a piece of paper, I wanted it exactly... Right, so Paul Merton was speaking as the whistle went then, gained that extra point. He's now one behind our leader, who is still Clement Freud. Oh, he's equal with Graham Norton in second place. Graham, it's your turn to begin. The subject is, what I keep in my sporran. <laughs> That's a nice subject for someone as outrageous as you, Graham. (laughs) Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. What I keep in my sparring is not the same as it used to be. Following an unfortunate incident involving yogurt some years ago, (laughs) I've 
learned not to keep perishables in my sparring. Look as you might, you won't find cheese or even cold sliced bit of meat. No, now it's all stationery, tissues, a selection of pencils. Go on, take one. I really don't mind. My sparring is made out of my dead dog, Trixie. <laughs> Because I thought it was nice to keep the weekend terrier with me for the rest of my life. And of course, now I don't have to feed her and... Oh, thank God for that. The sad thing about this game is that someone can go hilariously as that for 52 seconds and get nothing for it. It is all, but it's worse than that, actually. So even big, but whoever challenges correctly, and it was Clement Freud, what was the challenge? I think it's a check, right? He know. repeated, of course. He repeated, of course, that's right. And so you have eight seconds to tell us something about what I keep in my spot, and uh, Clement, starting now. Underpants, Mars bars, Milky Ways, <laughs> and occasional pieces of Gorgonzola or Dolcinata cheese. <laughs> So, Graham, who did all the hard work and uh, entertained the audience, has got no points at all. Clement Freud coming in with eight seconds to go and getting one for speaking as a whistle. Wen got two more. And he's now equal with Graham Norton in the lead. Uh, Paul Merton, it's your turn to begin. The subject is turning <laughs> the corner. Can you speak on turning the corner in 60 seconds if you want to, starting now? Yes, I would like to address these words to the inhabitants of China. The general Chinese must know they believe they are turning the corner. It's been a long time since the Great March. <laughs> <laughs> Long times is a long march, I was going to yes, say. Yes, I know, it's so difficult, isn't it? Uh, Ross, you came in first. Hesitation, obviously. 51 <laughs> seconds, turning the corner with you, starting now. Turning the corner is an important skill to have if you're a nurse. When you're making up the beds, you have to make sure that you can turn the corner over the edge. Unfortunately, in hospitals, they tend to use sheets instead of the duvet-type device, which is placed over with the elasticated edge. It's interesting to see nurses using the elasticated... Oh, I've said it twice... <laughs> It's a frustrating game, but they loved it, uh, Ross. But, Paul, you got in first on the elasticated. 32 seconds, turning the corner with you, starting now. Charlie Chaplin used to turn a corner in his films by skidding around on one foot and sticking the other one out at a very strange angle. And this was considered a very funny... Very, 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 very... <laughs> very, 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 very... <laughs> very, very, very. <laughs> and Ross was first in again. I can't emphasise that enough. <laughs> So, yes, he's emphasised the fact he did repeat very. Ross was the first to buzz, and he's got the subject with 22 seconds. Turning the corner, Ross, starting now. Turning the corner is an important skill to have also. Uh, Graham Norton, challenge. Oh, important and skill. Uh, you mentioned important before. Oh, yes, important. yes. You listen very carefully to what they said the first time and come back up. What do you mean? Oh, he's entitled. This is the rule. This is just a minute. It's a correct challenge. So, I know, uh, but I'm, I'm playing it like it's war games or something. <laughs> <laughs> this lot started. I know, yeah, no, in fairness, they did. Yeah. But well, you were the one that challenged me on I. Yeah, him, not yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, no, not you. Yeah. You've been sweet. No, I'll let that go. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, quite like, relaxed for the whole thing, really. Exactly. They do if we can't get on up here, what, what example is that for the world that listens to us? Yeah. Well, I do have to say to Ross, who's the first time with us, that, uh, you know, the audience can get like this. It's when they start walking towards you that you need to do stuff. Like that. Usually yes. happens round about now, doesn't it? <laughs> Graham, you have 20 yes. seconds. Turning the corner, starting now. As a non-driver, I adore or turning the corner. Oh, what fun it is to put a pen or perhaps some loose change on the dashboard each time you're turning the corner and wait for the driver to become so irate. Oh, a Clement Freud challenge. Reputational driver. Yes, you had the driver more than once. No, no, non-driver. Yes, oh, no. Ah, a bit of a hyphen. Non-driver is hyphenated. Uh, hyphenated words are accepted as um, not a repetition. So, um, Graham, you have a, a this incorrect. This is great count. news now. Every <laughs> <laughs> hyphens for days. Okay. <laughs> so, just, 
Uh, if the turning of the oh, corner yes, is the subject, right. you have an incorrect challenge, you have another point, and you have six seconds starting now. Turning the corner isn't all it's cracked up to be. If people had been busy turning the corner, we would have never... <laughs> Graham Norton was then speaking as a whistle went with other points in that round. He has now surged ahead, and he has taken the lead for those I interested I felt in the points. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> you are two points ahead, <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the other three are all equal in second place, only two points behind. And Graham, it's your turn to begin. The subject is rambling. Are you a rambler? If, anyway, talk on the subject starting <laughs> now. Rambling is a popular pastime. Using... Uh. <laughs> Paul. A su sudden stop. A sudden stop. Sadly. <laughs> Paul hesitation. A point to you, Paul. 56 seconds. Rambling, starting now. Rambling is a popular pastime using your feet as you walk along the various paths that are laid out by various, 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 uh, various... Graham Norton challenge. Yes, I did. Yes, you did. Uh, it, uh, it was various, you said. That's twice. right, yes, various. Twice. You repeated yes. various, right. 49 seconds. Ramblings back with you, Graham, starting now. Rambling is made up of people, men and women, usually, and they wear matching jumpers. That's the law. <laughs> Consider, then, the difficulty of the rambling rose. How would such a thorny bush get inside knitwear? It would be very difficult. The upside is that when the farmer shouts, get off my land, the little flowery thing... Ross, oh, there was a bit of a hesitation, but hesitation. I feel quite bad about that. No, no, don't. <laughs> really don't. Don't. Nobody, <laughs> nobody feels bad in this show, Ross. If they can get in and get the points and get the subject, which is what you've achieved, you go on rambling with 24 seconds starting now. Ramblers take their rights of way very seriously, and it's often fun to try and put obstacles in the way just to see them <laughs> stick to the paths that they've chosen. For example, a large paddling pool that a child might play in in the summertime, <laughs> filled up with soapy water, watching them slide around as packed lunches fly all over the Yes. Often a bearded man will slip and bang his head against the... Well, you've got the audience 100% with you, uh, Ross, and you have leapt forward at the end of that round. You're still one behind Graham Norton. <laughs> and you are three behind Clement Freud, who is two behind our leader, Paul Merton, and that is the situation as we go into the final round. Would it be fair to say that Ross is last, then? <laughs> no, 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 four. <laughs> four. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Don't no. pull any punches, you know. <laughs> no, no, I, I, always, I never put it that way, because nobody is last in this show. Because the... Ross, well, Ross is. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're so close to standing up and just pointing at me going, LOSER! <laughs> No, no, it's the contribution which is important, not the points. And Ross, from the audience reaction, they know your contribution is valued. I'm and still we... not winning, though, am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the first time you've been on the yeah, show. You've done jolly well to keep true. up with the others the way you have. And you take the last round. It's belly laughs. Well, you take it, but you start it anyway. Uh, um, no, I didn't mean that unkind. Don't, miss that. <laughs> Don't bother being nice. He's losing, yeah, Nicholas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the subject is belly laughs. Ross, it's your turn to begin, and you start now. Belly laughs describe the type of laugh that comes deep within the stomach and rises up. This is why I always make a point of never performing in front of fat people. The trouble with that is that it takes so long for it to make its way through their large guts that you can be on stage for over two and a half hours before a simple titter has left the mouth. Sometimes those mouths are actually filled with crisps. Uh, Clement Floyd Challenge. Sorry. Right. I thought he said mouth twice. He, in, uh, yeah. he said mouth and mouths. Yeah. He said mouth mm. and mouths, yes. So Sorry. Actually, you get a point for that. Yeah, yes, I challenge. intended to do yes, that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you could, you could win yet, you know. You're no moving way. forward. Yes, you've got another point there. <laughs> You're now equal with Graham Norton. You've got another 37 seconds. Get challenged a few more times. <laughs> Belly laughs. Starting now. Another good way to get belly laps is to go down to a plastic surgeon's. Uh, Graham Norton challenge. Well, sort of deviation, because we haven't heard a good way to get them yet. <laughs> Why is not sort of? It doesn't matter if it's a good way or a bad way to get them. No, it doesn't matter. It's not deviation. No. But it's no. not another. It's the only way we've heard so far. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, by the way, listeners, that was Ross putting his buzzer right into Graham Norton's face. Uh, uh, Sorry, I've turned now. I just want to win. I just want to win. 
Uh, and you've got an extra point now. Oh, so I God. Because again, I'm explaining to the listeners, I have two on my left and two on my right. Graham and Norton you, and Frost. You should see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You're wasted on radio, really, aren't you? I <laughs> know. Right. Another point to you, Ross. You still have the subject. 34 seconds. Belly laughs starting now. If you go down to a liposuction clinic and remove all of the fat that they've thrown into the bins, you can push that into a space hopper. And it really is a humorous way of spending an afternoon. <laughs> People will go, look at the belly laughs they're having as you bounce around on top of someone's lardy innards. <laughs> Little kids enjoying themselves as the race continues down the street in the international hopping challenge that is... <laughs> in the thing next. So, Paul Martin, you challenged. There was a hesitation, didn't there? Was that? I gave his going so the audience were laughing so much I couldn't hear any hesitation, actually. <laughs> Remember the audience, audience mob audience. rule. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he can win anyway, actually, but I know you'd like him to win. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but you might for cash, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's out in the lead. You would like Ross to finish the show, wouldn't you? Because there's only eight seconds to go. I thought so, right. So, eight Ross, seconds. the audience want you to finish the show. There's eight seconds available. Oh, Carry on, belly laugh. <laughs> oh, please, no. Starting now. The biggest belly laugh I ever received was when I took part in a school sports day. I climbed up to the top of a diving board and leapt and, off. And uh, Paul Burton challenge. Two eyes. <laughs> Oh, right back to the beginning of the show, yes. <laughs> Tit for tat, he didn't forget it. He was waiting to get back. An Ross, eye for an eye. Ross. <laughs> you never spoke a truer word. He got you on the eyes the first round, and you got him in the very last round with one second to go. <laughs> right. You have one second, Paul, on belly laughs starting now. Work and hell, a very funny face. <laughs> so... I said that was to be the last round, and indeed it is the last round, and I give you just the final score for those interested in the points. Well, on this occasion, uh, Graham Norton was only just in fourth place. But, uh, no, 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 fourth place is really, I mean, that's almost like winning on this show, but not, not quite. It's closer to being last. It's closer to being last. And one point ahead of him, because he did so well with that last flourish of his, was Ross Noble. And one point ahead of him, so he shows you how close it was. Can I just was say, I Clement gave you Floyd. that point. Yes. yes. <laughs> and a few points ahead was Paul Merton. So we say, this week, Paul Merton, you are our winner. <laughs> it only remains for me to say... Thank you to our four exciting players of the game, which is Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Ross Noble and Clement Freud. I thank Janet Staplehurst for helping me keep the score, blowing her whistle on the 60 seconds. We thank our producer, Claire Jones, for her tolerance and understanding and forbearance, and also the man who originally created the game that was Ian Messiter. And we're indebted to this lovely, excitable audience here at the Pleasance in Edinburgh. And from me and from all of us here, Nicholas Parsons, until we meet again, goodbye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my extreme pleasure to welcome our many listeners, not only in this country, in the United Kingdom, but also throughout the world, and also to welcome the four talented, skillful, witty, humorous individuals who this week are going to play just a minute, and we welcome back four who played it with tremendous skill in the past, and that is Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Greg Proops, and Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on a subject that I give them, and they will try and do that if they can without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Janet Staplehurst, who's going to help me keep a score, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Pleasance in Edinburgh. As we begin the show with Clement Freud, Clement, the subject in front of me is Whiz Kids. Tell us something about Whiz Kids in Just a Minute, if you can, starting now. Hamish and Ophelia Whiz of Ashby de la Zouche 
have a numerous family and the kids are called Adam, Bernard, Charles, David, Eric, Ferdinand, Frank, George, twins, Harry, Isaac, James, Kenneth, <laughs> Leonard, uh, uh, Martin. Paul, Paul Martin has challenged you. Uh, Hesitation. There was, he was really, he was getting a bit slow with them, and I think we have to interpret that as hesitation. <laughs> so uh, you did jolly well with that list, because it's not easy, actually. But uh, Paul Merton has a correct challenge. So he has a point for that. He takes over the subject, and there are 37 seconds available. Whiz Kids, starting now. William Hague recently claimed that he drank 18 pints of beer a day while delivering... <coughs> uh, Clement Freud challenge. Deviation. What? He claimed he drank 14 pints of beer. <laughs> After ten, he couldn't remember how many it was. <laughs> well, according to the newspaper report I read, yes, it was 14 pints of beer. So, Clement, you've cleverly got back in with a correct challenge, a point to you. <laughs> well, it's a correct challenge. That's the rules of just a minute. 32 seconds. Whiz kids with you, Clement, starting now. Ariadne, Atalanta, <laughs> Beatrice, Charlotte, Desiree, Erica... Uh, Graham Norton challenge. Oh, now, is this, and I'm just clutching at straws, is this a sort of deviation? Because it's not established this time that it's the whiz kids. It's a sort of deviation, but... Uh, I'm I probably they, wrong, I just think, asking. I think they have a right to be named. Hmm? They have a right to be named. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think, I think, uh, it's, it's a difficult decision. And we have a right to be entertained. <laughs> A bonus point how many, kids, how many kids have they got? <laughs> right. Uh, great, Bruce. I, we, the audience enjoyed your interjection so much. I'm going to give you a bonus point for that. Well, thank you. Yes, there we are. And, That'll um, be my point for the day. And, uh, <laughs> so you take over the subject of whiz kids, Graham, with a point, of course, 25 seconds, starting now. Whiz? And uh, Clement has challenged. He hesitated. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and we've only just begun, ladies and gentlemen. One moment Clement shows his generous answer. <laughs> the next minute he shows the other side and says, hesitate. No, it wasn't hesitation. Uh, uh, Graham, you have another point. You have whiz kids. You have 24 seconds starting now. Whiz kids are the sort of young people who have more A-levels than friends. Oh, yes. They can reboot an entire room full of computers, but they don't know the difference between sweet or dry cider. True, whiz kids make a lot of money, and they do keep the corduroy industry afloat float. But are they really happy in themselves? I can... Whoever is speaking as the whistle is blown gains an extra point. On this occasion it was Graham Norton, so he's taken a commanding lead at the end of the first round. He has three points, and the other three each have one point. So, of course you're not interested, are you? Really <laughs> Some people are interested in points. Greg Proops, will you take the next round? The subject here is the hair of the dog. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. I'm reminded of a joke by the late singer and famous drunk Dean Martin, who said, I feel sorry for people who don't drink, because that's as good as they're going to feel all day long. <laughs> The hair of the... A uh, Paul Martin challenge. Uh, slight hesitation. There was more than a slight one, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I was breathing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you... Can we... Uh, are we allowed... To... You have to take quick, short breaths. Yes, in you're just right. Sorry you're about being yes. a mammal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Martin, the correct challenge. You have the subject. You have 47 seconds. The hair of the dog starting now. I remember a joke on Rowan and Martin's laughing. They used to have this ticker tape stuff going across the back of the screen and it said one day, go home, Dean Martin, your swimming pool is on fire. And I thought at the time that was a particularly amusing... I said it's gone down well, isn't it? <laughs> and I can see that there are many people here tonight who are experiencing the hair of the dog because Edinburgh as a festival does relish the alcohol. The pubs stay open, unlike Dan in the uncivilised south where they close half past ten on a Sunday. Here, you can drink from May to December any time you like and it doesn't matter. That's why the highest alcoholic ratio per head is here in Scotland rather than down in Tunbridge Wells. Well, Freud challenge. Repetition of here. Yes, you did. <laughs> mm. They're not enjoying the game element very much, are they? <laughs> they like the talking, not the game. 
Yes. The game is what it's all about, and he did. In fact, he repeated it twice, so Clement did actually wait. So um, it is a correct challenge, Clement. Within the rules of just a minute, I give it to you. You have a point. You have 12 seconds. You have the hair of the dog starting now. The saying is, the hair of the dog that bites you is quite unlike the hair of the dog that you take on the sidewalk to go to McDonald's and eat. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. I don't think that is the saying. <laughs> That's not how the saying goes. That's, That's just something Clement's made up for his own fancy. <laughs> That's what sayings up. are. Mm. Uh, but, but he's made it up. We, we can't dispute it because within the rules of just a minute, he didn't hesitate, he didn't repeat any words, and uh, I don't think he's actually deviated. There's one second. Clement Freud, incorrect challenge, a point to you, the hair of the dog starting now. Brown. And Paul Brennan challenge. Hesitation. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> You're keen and not keen enough, no. Half a second, the hair of the dog, Clement, starting now. White. <laughs> Clement Freud was then speaking as the whistle went, gained the extra point. He's now equal in the lead with Paul Merton and the other two are trailing a little behind. And, Graham, your turn to begin. The subject is how to take a compliment. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. How to take a compliment is a mystery to me. For to my certain knowledge, I don't think I've ever received one. <laughs> I arrive at parties, people open the door and go, oh, it's you. <laughs> go in there, why don't you? I would love to receive a compliment because it's a, a very good thing to get, I believe. Maybe I should learn how to take a compliment. And then that way, if someone said, Greg Proops, you're very funny, I could go, I'm Greg Proops. Oh, I've said that twice, haven't I? <laughs> yes, Shame. a clever try. Yes, Clement gone in first. Too much of Greg Proops um, in the game. You understand me? Uh, repetition. Right, 30 seconds, Clement, how to take a compliment, starting now. The very best thing, best place to which to take a compliment is uh, a... Greg Proops challenge. I'm afraid I'm going to have to... He said best twice. Repetition? Yes. Yes. Well done, Greg. 25 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Greg, you look at me. I just, I, I just forget to say repetition first. Adam. Yeah, no, but you looked at me so apologetically. <laughs> It was my way of saying, yes, you are right. It wasn't me being condescending. No, I appreciate no, no, yeah, that. Yes, right. Thank goodness for that. Uh, 25 seconds. How to take a compliment starting now. How to take a compliment. For instance, if Nicholas Parsons says, well done, don't look at him that way. <laughs> because he interprets this as the kind of glance that means that I didn't know what I was talking about. Whereas what I was actually doing was flubbing around, waiting for something to come into my brain so that I could accept a compliment. My point is this. When someone pays you a compliment, Compliment, it is incumbent upon yourself to accept the compliment as fervently. So, Greg Proops speaking as a whistle when then gained that extra point, and now that's in the round, he's leapt forward. He's equal with Graham Norton in third place, a little way behind Clement Freud, and he's one behind our leader, Paul Merton. And Greg Proops, your turn to begin. The subject cardigans. And uh, 60 seconds as usual, starting now. Cardigans have many purposes. In Denmark... Uh, Paul Merton Challenge. Name five. <laughs> <laughs> well, five purposes for cardigans. Give, give, give us half a chance. <laughs> or maybe uh, if he continues, he will name five. Oh, all so. I want is five uses for a cardigan. Right. Well, you, it, it was an interruption okay. and uh, an incorrect challenge. So uh, there's nothing within the rules of just a minute. So you have another point, Greg. You have uh, 57 seconds to continue. Cardigans are starting now. The chief use for cardigans, number one, if you will. <laughs> During Christmas, Paul Merton wraps a cardigan around his head and listens to the show just a minute. The second use is the cardigan that Paul sits on while he listens. Uh, Paul challenge. Repetition of Paul. Paul oh, oh I, think you'll, I think you'll find I was referring to another Paul. <laughs> Fair enough. You may have been referring to another Paul, yes. but it's the words that count in just a minute, and you repeated the word Paul. So, Paul, you've got in with 44 seconds. Tell us something about cardigans, starting now. It's like a jumper, except that you can button it up. There are seven uses for cardigans. <laughs> One is rescuing sheep off the side of hills. Two is saving cows who have fallen off cliffs. Three is persuading a horse to eat chocolate against its will. Four is to make a traffic warden go purple when you tie it very tightly around his neck. Five, as in a distress signal when you're at sea, you can wave it at the other ships. Oh, he hasn't got a flag, but he's got a nice cardigan. It must be a 
And I think that's about as many uses to a cardigan as they are, so I rest my case. Clement Freud challenge first. He's rested his case. And so that was hesitation. <laughs> right. So you tell us something about cardigans, Clement. 13 seconds available starting now. Uh, <laughs> It was a hesitation. It was a hesitation. He obviously doesn't know much None about None of us that. like it, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it hadn't been me who'd drawn, you know, drawn attention to it. Well, come on. More cardigans with you. Twelve seconds, Paul, starting now. The cardigans who live in Cardiff have a tremendously large family. There's Bob, <laughs> Carol, Ted, Alice, Sammy, William, Frank, Bernard, <laughs> Shelley... <laughs> So Paul Martin kept going to the whistle when gained that extra point for doing so with the others in the round. He's taking the lead just ahead of Clement Freud and then come Graham Norton and Greg Proops in that order. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, the icing on the cake. There are 60 seconds as usual, starting now. The icing on the cake is traditionally sweet. The sugar can be brown or white. Icing, castor, granulated, Barbados... <laughs> Demerara. <laughs> Never mind where it comes from. The icing is the important thing. It makes the cake. <laughs> <laughs> hesitation. Yeah. And there was a hesitation. I cake was, yeah. No, so, Paul, you got in first. 41 seconds. The icing on the cake starting now. Whenever I come here to the festival, the icing on the cake for me is to do just a minute. I travel up here, particularly from London, specially to record this show. It's a great, wonderful programme to be involved in, and I think we should all reflect on it for a moment in silence. <laughs> Thank you for that round of applause. <laughs> I feel that's for all of us. But Clement Freud buzzed his buzzer in the, in the process, and you have got... I reflected. You reflected. <laughs> and you're going to have a hesitation, are you? I Absolutely. thought you might. So, 26 seconds, Clement. <laughs> the icing on the cake starting now. A matter of fascination to me is that organic articles are now put into cakes and icings. Sugar that never, ever... I said sugar before. Paul, we have had sugar before. We have had sugar yeah. before, yeah. Right at the beginning, Not yes. sugar. So, yeah. Paul, you've got in with 13 seconds on this subject. The icing on the cake starting now. The icing has to be, as Clement has said, particularly sweet. A bitter icing would be a contradiction in terms, almost. Who wants to eat an acid cake? Nobody. Uh, Graham, Chan. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You've never eaten an acid cake in your life. My mother's a professional chemist. <laughs> <laughs> There's food and drink to us at home. <laughs> Poor devils. Mm, love as long it. as you mm. don't eat a cake with acid in it, that's the oh, most important. Yeah, a little sulfuric. Yeah, sports. right. No, no. Uh, Graham has got his bonus point, which you've been searching for, but Paul was interrupted, so he gets a point. I wonder where I left it. Yes. <laughs> And two seconds for you, Paul, to continue on. The icing on the cake, Paul, starting now. Mr Kipling is a man who knows a lot about cakes. <laughs> and I know, I know. Paul Merton was speaking then as the whistle went, so he's now leapt forward and he's overtaken Clement Freud. He's now in the lead just two ahead of him and Graham Norton and Greg Proops following that order. And Greg, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is the British climate. As an American, can you talk about the British climate? 60 seconds starting now. The British climate can be described in one word, no bloody sun. The moisture that clouds the sky here creates an atmosphere of levity and optimism unparalleled anywhere else in Europe. Why one has but to walk down the street of anywhere on this favored island to see people go, hi neighbor, howdy, come on over, we're having a barbecue. <laughs> I invite everyone, one and all, to join us in our levity as the beams from the gigantic orange orb penetrate our skin, turning us into the richly colored favored people. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. Are you being sarcastic? <laughs> <laughs> he certainly was, but he was still keeping going within the, the rules of just a minute and entertaining the audience. So, uh, incorrect challenge, Greg. Got another point. Hurrah! Eh? You've got 26 seconds. <laughs> the British climate with you starting now. The British climate is something that the people of Britain seek to escape. For each year, they take trips to Florida, where the sun hangs high in the... Uh, Graham Norton Challenge. A repetition of sun. 
Yes, yes the yes. sun was right. before, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Graham caught me out on that one, you clever oh. nipper, you. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening, Graham, I was listening. you've yeah, got I in on the British climate, and you have 17 seconds starting now. Oh, look at you. We may have lost the empire, every major sporting event, and other things beside, but there's still a British climate. God damn it. <laughs> we can be very proud of it, for nowhere else in the world has a climate... <laughs> <laughs> Graham Norton <laughs> was speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point for doing so Clement it's your turn to begin the subject stalemate tell us something about stalemate in this game if you can starting now I went into a cafe and a man said what do you think of the icing on the cake <laughs> I said stalemate <laughs> because the sugar which was white and sweet and contained Demerara had sort of... <laughs> Full challenge. Deja vu, I think. <laughs> I think we've heard all this before, haven't we? Uh, we have, but... Uh, but not on this, it, not on this not, subject. But, but not on this... Right. But what is your challenge first? And I just, um, I'll decide. I, well, you tell me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not psychic. I'm not playing psychic just no, a minute. No, I, I don't know. I haven't got one. Uh, no, no, but you, it, it could have been. If he'd gone on a bit longer about um, icing on the cake, then it would have been away from stalemate. I don't think he deviated long enough, so, Paul, uh, Clement, you still have the subject. And another point, of course. And 44 seconds stalemate starting now. When you play chess with one of your children, be it Charlie or Fred. Uh, Graham Norton Challenge. See, I don't have any children, Clement. <laughs> what has that got to do with... You're not trying I said when enough. you play chess with your children. I can't play chess, I've got no children. Well, he's talking personally. When he, he was, I took it to the fact that he was playing with his children. Is I... everything about you? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> So have you got another... Everything revolves around Graham. <laughs> have you got another challenge within the rules of just a minute? All right. Oh, do, do I have another one? You can have another chance, yes. Uh, 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 deviation? No. I could you give me a hesitation? Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this so is a much Clement, better game, isn't it? There's Clement, no... You just got to guess. You have 39 seconds, Clement. Stalemate starting now. Queens, rooks, pawns are all hugely important to affecting a stalemate in a game which you play which is pronounced C-H-E-S. Uh, full challenge. It's spelt C-H-E-S. <laughs> it's not pronounced. It's not pronounced. <laughs> That's the tough thing of keeping going in just a minute. Yes, a correct challenge. A point to you, Paul. And you have stalemate 27 seconds starting now. I've really got nothing to say about it. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Unkind. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the show like anyone else. <laughs> I must say his timing was impeccable, but, uh, but the thing is, you haven't got, have you got any other challenges when the rules are just a minute? No, you haven't. Because actually, he can say I've nothing much to say about the subject and still go on talking about it. That's, uh, that's just a minute. So, Paul, it was an incorrect challenge. You have another point. You have 25 seconds. Stalemate starting now. There was two cars driving down a country lane, each from the opposite direction, and they stopped in the middle of this road and decided that neither one of them was going to back up to let the other vehicle through. And so they were there for several hours until eventually the police were called and through a... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. What a wonderful sketch Paul. that was in your show, Paul. I yes. remember it very well. <laughs> That's why I talked about it with some authority. I know. That's it. <laughs> Clement, a correct challenge. The subject is stalemate. There are eight seconds available starting now. The stalemate could be... Uh, Paul Clinton challenge. Why don't you shut up? <laughs> 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 Two can play at that. I know, and uh, he gets another point. As you got a point the other time. So keep saying shut up to each other. You can keep giving each other points like this and run away with it from the other two on the left-hand side of the stage. Um, Paul, uh, Clement, seven seconds. Stalemate starting now. A stalemate could be a situation in which two cars coming at each other from opposite directions. <laughs> Freud and Paul Merton on my right are battling it out in the lead. One is one point ahead, Clement Freud of Paul Merton, and the other two are battling it out in second place on my left. That's Greg Proops and Graham Norton. And Graham, it's your turn to begin. The subject, the subject is a free lunch. 
Tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now. The idea of a free lunch is wonderfully appealing, but we must pause and consider, dear friends, the emotional cost. Yes, it's a wedding buffet you haven't paid, you're gobbling it all down, but the trauma of having to talk to relatives you don't really know very well. Perhaps they're an architect or an accountant, and they'll go on to you about how actually working with figures in my job is a bit like being an actor. And you think, no, it's not. It's really dull. Shut up. Go away. Let me get on with a free lunch. I'm quite enjoying it without you. Am I still talking? It seems I am. Uh, a free lunch. I need you to get really. You yeah, could well, go no, into... No, you, 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 yes, you can stop talking. Oh, I Paul has challenged you, actually. There wasn't much noise from his buzzer, but his light came on, so I know he challenged. Yes, Paul? Yes. What? He's still talking. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so have your challenge when the rules are just a minute. No, but it would have been funny if it had come in quicker. <laughs> what had it come in quicker? My challenge. Oh, right. A right. lot of, lot of, lot of funny in about. <laughs> Well, the audience will not be so much. <laughs> so he's still talking, and he has 17 what? seconds. You're still, it's really good. <laughs> this, is, this is getting a little metaphysical for me. Yeah, he's still... asking if he's still talking while he's talking, and then you're <laughs> telling him he's talking while he's not talking. <laughs> so is he talking or is he not talking? <laughs> and when do we know if he's started or stopped? For instance, are you talking now? No, just a minute, Greg. Greg, you've earned another bonus point. So sorry. You're, 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 you're Greg, Greg, actually, I've just looked here. You've got about eight or nine points, and nearly all of them are bonus points. But, um, <laughs> but that is the great value to the show. I mean, it's the contributions, isn't it? Right. Um, Graham, you're still talking. Oh, when you start. <laughs> A free, you still have a free lunch, and you still have 17 seconds starting now. My favourite free lunch consists of cake icing. Nothing but that, piled very high on a plate. I eschew the marzipan. I don't like that. But the hard white stuff on top of it, particularly if it's free, and especially if it's at lunchtime... Graham Norton, the speaking as the whistle went and gained that extra point for doing so. In fact, he started with the subject and finished with it and was interrupted once or twice so he got points. He's moved forward. He's trailing Paul Merton a little. We're moving into the final round, I should tell you. Uh, Clement Freud is just in the lead, one ahead of Paul. So I think it's between those two. But the others still have a chance. And Greg Fruits is trailing Graham Norton. It's in that sequence as Paul Merton begins the final round, which is Whippersnapper. Tell us something about whippersnapper, uh, Paul, starting now. Well, it's an old-fashioned English word meaning, quite literally, whippersnapper. And <laughs> it usually refers to young people, perhaps kids maybe, who are slightly just out of short trousers or indeed long pants, whichever way you look at it, who are very, very, uh, very, very... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. Very, yes, very, 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 yes, um, it's difficult, yeah. isn't it? 43 seconds, Clement, you've got the subject. Whippa snapper, uh, and I said 43 seconds, starting now. A snapper is a sort of pinkish fish, much loved in the country from which Greg Proops comes. And a whipper would simply be a chap with a lasso attempting to catch the snapper, <laughs> making him... Uh, Cram Norton challenged. Sorry, there'd be a whip then, wouldn't it? <laughs> A lasso is a whip. No, he was, I'm just he, chatting now. A man I, just, who it. I just thought you mightn't get around to telling us what I asked. I think he yes, was sir. trying to convey that they were, he was sort of whipping in the snappers. Oh, I see. And uh, it's a rather bizarre idea, but within the rules of just a minute, I don't think he was deviating. That's actually. interesting, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but we loved hearing from you. Yeah, no, no. Yes. It's always nice to hear from you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. Are you yeah. well? Yeah, 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 I'm good. How are you? Looking <laughs> You're both doing well. Uh, and 27 <laughs> seconds, Clement Freud, another ch uh, point to you. Whippersnapper starting now. A photographer taking pictures of flagellation could well be termed a whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton challenged. A triumphant silence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, when you get laughs like that, you rest on your laurels, don't you? And, uh, 
and uh, the shock he got as well as the applause. Right. So, uh, Paul, yes, uh, hesitation, definitely. 14 seconds available with you, whippersnapper, starting now. When I first appeared on Just a Minute in 1988, I was very much regarded as a whippersnapper. I was a young boy, wet behind... Uh, Greg Proop's challenge. I believe he said young before. Yes, I did. Yes, he did. Oh. And he was young. Yes, a whippersnapper. He was talking about the young people. Yes. Yeah. So, Greg, you got in, and there are seven seconds left. Uh, you might even finish this show for us. I don't mean to finish it off. You don't understand me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you could. <laughs> w- welcome to the final episode. <laughs> This could be the final contribution of this particular episode. There's seven seconds available with you, Greg, on Whippersnapper, starting now. Whippersnapper is what my father would call me when I was a young lad. When I... Oh! <laughs> so, Greg Crooks, who's not played the game as much as the others, uh, got some points at the end there, and he's finished up equal with Graham Norton in third place. They had a large number of points. Lovely contribution. But uh, they were just behind Paul Merton, and two ahead of Paul Merton was Clement Freud. So this week we say, Clement, you are our winner. (laughs) So... It only remains for me to say thank you to our four intrepid and daring players of the game, which is Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Greg Proops and Clement Freud. And I also thank Janet Snaplehurst for helping me with the score and blowing her whistle. We are indebted to our producer, Claire Jones, who keeps us in order as much as she can and puts the show together. And we're also indebted to the creator of this game, Ian Messiter, and we're deeply indebted to this lovely audience here at the Pleasance of the Festival Fringe who've cheered us on our way nobly and with great vivacity. From from our audience, from the players, from me, Nicholas Parsons, until we meet again. Goodbye.